Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This is a Fireside Frights episode. All the stories tonight are sent in by you, the listeners of Weird Darkness. Plus, in these episodes I strip away all the music, the sound effects, and other fancy audio production. It's just you, me, this campfire, and your stories. And uh, I might be a little bit hoarse tonight. I, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm already starting to feel a little hoarse. I might not sound it yet, but I've done a lot of voice work today. Um, I did a lot of stuff for Ping and Roar as Tremble, the Daddy Dinosaur, and uh, that has a tendency to rip up my throat a little bit if I do a lot of it at once. Um, plus, I was working on uh, tomorrow's micro-terrors early on. We've actually got two listener stories, uh, one from a 10-year-old and one from an 11-year-old, and uh, so I'll be, I have to produce two of those tonight, which I've already voiced. I haven't put them together yet, um, but I've done a lot of voice work today uh, for my clients. Oh, I did another one for um, for a truck pull website today. It's Full Pull Live. It's a, it's a brand new uh, website that has streaming pulls of trucks and tractors and stuff like that. They're getting ready to uh, have their very first event, um, but if you go to fullpull.live, uh, you can actually see the promo that I created for them. Uh, well, uh, voice for them. I didn't, I didn't do the video stuff, but I did the voiceover for them um, a few weeks ago, and today they came back to me for more as they get ready for their first event. And so that's going to be really cool to be associated with. So all of that to say, I might start to get a little bit hoarse as we go, but it has been so long since we've done a Fireside Frights. It has been several months. I used to try to do these once a month, and then um, I ended up getting off track I, I was either sick or on vacation or I didn't I didn't think I had enough stories or whatever and so now it's been a really really long time and I'm sorry for that. Uh, I've had a lot of you uh, message me both on on Facebook and on YouTube and email uh, so all three of those uh, saying hey I really like your fireside frights looking forward to a new one so <laughs> here we are. Uh, if you're new here welcome to the show while you're listening uh, you can check out weirddarkness.com where you can find Weird Darkness merchandise, you can visit sponsors that you might hear about during the show, you can sign up for my newsletter. By the way, the newsletter, I am going to bring back doing monthly prizes on that. It's been a while since we did that, especially during the COVID situation. I kind of pulled back on that, but I think I'm going to give away at least one prize pack a month uh, through the newsletter. I'll, I'll work on that a little bit later on so I can announce it officially but if you're not already on the newsletter, you then that gives you incentive to do so. Just go to just go to WeirdDarkness.com, sign up for the newsletter there. Um, that's also where you can enter contests, which those are those two kind of go hand in hand right now. Uh, you can connect with me on social media there. You can hear my other podcasts that I'm a part of. You can free audiobooks I've got, uh, and of course the Hope in the Darkness page. If you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, addiction, you can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All right, here. What you're here for. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. By the way, something I forgot to mention before I get into this first story, I don't write, I don't read these in advance. I like to be surprised as I do these, so uh, and, and I can't edit out my mistakes during a Fireside Frights. So uh, this, is, this is me at my core, at my bare, ba at my bare basic. All right, this first one comes from a Genocide Doll. Uh, that, obviously, it's not her real name, but that's the name that she goes by. She says, uh, this is really long. I don't know if it's too long, but you know what? I kind of like to. I kind of like starting with, uh, with somewhat long episodes, so that's cool. I don't mind doing that. Or not episodes, but uh, stories. So uh, here we go. Uh, hello, it's Jen and friend. My baby doll is still in storage, unfortunately, but she seems content. She's not lonely. She has much company. I do miss her. I'm sharing another story, or rather insane ramblings, that jump back and forth in time because I have no concept of time being potentially an ageless urban cryptid myself. It's definitely a collection of weird and awkward. Hella awkward. Super awkward. So I was a teen in high school, if I remember right, fully going into my goth phase and expanding my view of the world simply enjoying the company of myself and my so far visible only to sensitives, witches, and psychic people's friend. 
My mother and her partner didn't like this phase, wanting it to end quickly. They thought I was going to die, kill myself or other people because I liked horror movies and black lipstick. Natural overreaction to a teen exploring their personality that doesn't fit into what they want. They couldn't really justify punishment because I was getting good grades, I was well-behaved, wasn't into drugs, I was barely dating. Unlike other classmates and cousins who had joined gangs, gotten pregnant, caught up with drugs, and suspended from school, but they went to church and prayed, so obviously I was on the path to ruin. Apparently this required action to prevent me from continuing my life with the devil. Side note, I didn't worship the devil or even follow the Christian storyline. I was really into the Greek-slash-Roman and Egyptian pantheon. Also, learning other religions and lore, shout out to the Kali uh, doing her dance, my mom was Christian but her partner's family was more the closed-minded thought process of, if it ain't Jesus, it's the devil. Uh, my mother's partner brought in her family who had a mini-intervention where a step-aunt, aunt-in-law, and son uh, talked with me about hell and coming back to God, my mom and her partner being in the next room watching TV. I used to attend church as a child and even went to a Catholic school, but I didn't feel right in church. I would feel sick and have headaches even in the single digits age. Blessed items would feel like the physical equivalent of nails on a chalkboard. Many years later, a, um, a friend's girlfriend showed me a keychain from her trip to Rome. The second I touched it, I tossed it back to her like a hot potato. I asked her if it had been blessed. She said, yes, by the Pope. My boyfriend at the time just kind of laughed, saying not to give me blessed items. She stopped coming around after that. I had originally thought it was cool to go to Rome and see all that stuff. Yes, she wasn't comfortable anymore. Of course, my grandmother, who had continued to drag me to church in later years, would comfort me or explain the sick feelings as, shut up, you're embarrassing me, or that's not real, go sit down. Wise words from that woman, wise words. She kept pushing me to church until they asked her not to bring me anymore. Last time I went, I was around 14, 15. I talked with a new, young, cute priest and asked if he had uh, heard any good sins in confession. His face turned bright red and he didn't reply. Apparently he left after that, left everything, just tossed away all those years learning to be a priest. Guess it just wasn't for him. It wasn't just the physical illness that pushed me away, it was my own questions. I asked a lot of questions about the Bible and the stories, but was always told to just believe because God said so. I questioned and pointed out nonsensical things and contradictions, but was always punished without an answer. I eventually lost what little faith that was pushed onto me. I remember feeling like I had broken through a frozen lake and taking that first breath after being crushed in the cold, dark depths. Well, enough about the past. Instead, let's talk about the past. <laughs> Back to the awkward intervention, mother and son told me a story about a man who died and, while standing at the burning gates of evil fire hell, he saw a demon and was scared away from his terrible, sinful life. This demon was tall, black-skinned with a dragon or horse head, black, coarse hair with burning red eyes. He was the guard at the door while people filed in. Funny enough, no mention of him being mean, evil, or even doing the torture stuff. He was just watching people file into the gate or doorway. From my understanding, he seemed more like a bored security guard watching over people willingly walking in like a convention they really didn't want to go to. Hellcon 99, with special guest, the Lord of Lies, himself, Lucifer! Pictures and autographs all day, vendor area open in room 666. <laughs> Great writing there. When they started with the fire and brimstone story, I was zoning out, but when they described the very familiar demon, I was visibly excited, and I guess this made them uncomfortable. Funny enough, the demon from the story was something I'd been drawing for several years, so I had old pictures of my buddy in my sketchbooks. I showed the mother and son. This apparently scared them and they asked to prey on me. I don't like being touched and having no choice in this made me really uncomfortable. Eventually I relented because I didn't really have a choice. They pretty much had started preying on me and fighting it would make it last longer. Basically, lay back and think of England. It was super awkward and I was so very uncomfortable. I started to cry a little from how awful it felt, but they saw this as a good sign. This didn't sit well with my friend, as he didn't like people upsetting me and disregarding my wishes. After they prayed on me, I was expected to thank them, and I went to my room feeling dirty like I'd been violated. 
I turned on some music to help me relax and calm the ick, but this was just another experience of religious people crossing boundaries. That woman and her son never talked to me again. They suffered some hardships after that. Sudden onset of really bad luck. Lost job, divorce. Pretty sure someone died. The presence of my friend wasn't as strong around me a few days after the intervention. He was busy with stuff, but was back when it was done. I don't remember if this was before or after my parents blessed my room when I went out with friends. Yes, they did that. Rude, very rude. They blessed my room while I was out. I came home from hanging out with friends, feeling good and so happy. I was ready to crash on my bed and read, but I walked to my room, but it felt like I'd hit a wall at the doorway. My good mood was instantly killed, and I felt the energy in my room had been turned from warm and safe to oppressive and toxic. I did a quick glance, but I didn't need to see anything to know what had been done. I was so angry that it felt like I teleported to my parents' room. I came in yelling and demanding to know why they blessed my room. They tried to deny it and say they didn't go into my room. Lies. Straight lies. Frustrated, I growl at them about being in my room, and I can feel it. Eventually, they come clean and ask, uh, tell me that I at least keep the cross they placed hidden in my room. Knowing I couldn't really do anything about it, I say I'll leave it, but got rid of it later, or rather had a human friend take it out. I spent the rest of the night trying to purge the oppressive feeling of their blessings. I had to clean the mirror of holy oil, scrub the walls and floor from holy water. I burned candles and had to turn my bed to dig out the Bible that they hid in my bed frame. It didn't take me long to find everything in spite of them hiding it. I felt so sick for days after until I was able to, to uh, balance my room again. My trust in them was already diminishing, but now it was just gone. Things just got worse with them. It didn't matter that I was happy and feeling good in my own skin. I was taking a dark path, and the more they pushed me down to what they wanted, the worse I felt. I fell into deep depression, my health started to fail, and I started to self-harm. Everything they did to me to uh, me, uh, everything they did to make me good with God actually made me worse. My friend was still with me, trying to give me encouragement to fight the thoughts of self-harm. Sharp objects would suddenly vanish from around the house when I was feeling particularly broken down and wanting to harm myself or worse. Scissors would be next to me uh, one second, and as soon as I reached for them with intent to harm, they weren't there. Once I swallowed a full industrial-sized bottle of pain pills and just waited for them to do their thing, but my mom came home with a dinner that I found out later was a trigger food for our food allergies. It was a fast food meal. She hated those, but she kept being urged to pick it up. I was violently ill later that night, and everything left my body. I was so sick I'm pretty sure my soul left for a bit to smoke a cigarette just to get away for a while. Mom also got sick, but not as bad. So, food poisoning? Sure. My friend was mad at me, but he was still there for me. Very much like an upset authority figure who loves you too much but is still mad at your actions. He still spoke comforting words and told me stories of his home while I recovered. I remembered once I was feeling sad and disassociated from the world. I nearly walked into traffic in front of a truck, but I felt a hand pull me back but no one was around. I simply thanked my friend and tried to pay more attention to the world. Ironically, what most people see as dark and evil, I've always found comforting. I was never afraid of the dark as a child. I used to sit at my window and watch the stars and moon. I was okay with sunlight, but as I got older, it started to hurt my eyes and burn my skin more. Monsters and demons were beautiful to me. Feeling more like family, I lost an eerie haunted cat. Excuse me, feeling more like a family I lost, and eerie haunted castles and movies seemed more like a home I was chased from. I never felt comfortable in what people see as light, especially when you talk Bible at the end of the podcast. I tend to skip it, but it also means I miss out on the quotes I do want to hear, but alas, such is life. It is my choice to listen, and like many others, I must endure the uncomfortable times. Thank you for not being completely unbearable with the religion. Keep it weirder and all praise skin uh, and all praise skip the skip button. PS the devil still believes in you, he's your biggest cheerleader. Yay. Wow. Alright. <clears throat> I didn't realize this would be the story that I started with. Um, Genocide Doll uh, follows me on Instagram, and she sent me a message saying, hey, have you read my 
read my story yet, and I and I hadn't replied to her yet because I, I hadn't, and I, I I think now I know why she was asking because she wants any opinion on this. She she wants me to <sighs> she wants me to give my two cents. Genocide, you know what my two cents is going to be. You, you yourself uh, say that you skip the Bible verse at the end because it makes you feel uncomfortable. So you know where I'm coming from on this. And there are so many red flags and danger signs in this. I know you see them. And yet you choose to ignore them. You say that you've lost your faith. You've, you've got faith. It's just you've got faith on the dark side. And that's not a good thing. I have a hard time believing that you don't believe in God because if you didn't believe in God, then you wouldn't find crucifixes, the Bible, your room being blessed, uh, items being blessed. None of those would affect you if God didn't exist. So the idea that they do affect you proves that there is a good versus the evil that God does exist. At least it should prove that to you. And you say this guy is your friend. We're talking about a demon that's attached to you. He's not your friend. He pretends to be your friend. He's going to tell you what you want to hear. He's going to... He, uh, even demons can tell the truth so long as it fits their uh, motives, their, uh, their ideologies, their plans. But... Man, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry about all of this. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to you. I, I don't know why uh, you are so anti-God. Granted, you've actually had Christians in your life, uh, or supposed Christians, that have approached you in such a, a hard-nosed way that I don't think they realized they were doing more harm than good. You can't force someone to believe the way you believe. You can encourage them. You can tell them why you believe what you believe. But you can't tell them, you must believe the way I believe. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and you obviously know that, but unfortunately a lot of Christians don't know that. Um, but then again, a lot of Wiccans and Pagans and Satanists uh, don't understand that either. They they think everybody should should believe the way they do, and that's just the that's the human nature. That's the way we are. We all want people to believe the same thing that we believe because we believe that it's true. But you've got evidence here that what you're doing and and the way you're going is is damaging to you. The idea that the the, the idea that they would have to do an intervention and bless your room hide things in your room because they care about you. I know you felt violated in that. Uh, I understand why you would feel that way, but hopefully you also understand that they are concerned for your eternal soul. You might be a great girl getting great grades and never, and never being in trouble, unlike the supposedly good kids in your family who actually did do some bad things. But... It's the eternal aspect of your life you're, that, that they're concerned about. And, and I'm concerned for it now. Um, I, we've met briefly. I, 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 think we, I think we met at a, uh, at a horror con or uh, you know something along those lines. And I, I, if, I, if I remember you correctly, um, I kind of felt that, that you needed Jesus then as well. Um, so... You say thanks for not being the being a, like a push it, you know, being unbearable with religion is this the way you said it. Well, I might be unbearable now, uh, but yeah, I guess you got that skip button, and so you could skip the rest of this episode. And you probably aren't listening even more right now because because you don't like what I have to say. But I do hope you listen, and if if you want to drop me an email and talk about this. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. It's really hard to do this off the cuff uh, as I'm recording this and know exactly what to say and how to say it. But I, I do hope that you at least understand where people are coming from, that they actually do love you, and that's the reason that they're coming at you uh, with that. Uh, okay, moving on. I'm, so, I'm sorry, folks. I, I, I wouldn't If I had known that was going to be the first story, I wouldn't have started with it because that's not the best way to start off the Fireside Frights. Uh, this one comes from, let me read just to make sure that I, 
Okay, I have to read a little bit just to make sure that they, they don't want to stay anonymous. Okay, so this is Louisa. She says, Hi, Darren. I'm writing because I wished, uh, wished to tell you a story that was told to me. It happened when I was younger. So young that I do not remember it happening to me. After all, weird things do happen around me. There's no reason to believe it isn't true. And uh, after this incident, I quickly got referred to the witch in the family. However, I have to admit strange things happen to someone in our family at least once, so it can't be just me. So as I said, I was younger, but I don't know how old I was. I know it was a house that we moved to when I was two years old. The house was part of a terrace and had a reasonable-sized back garden. At this stage, it was mostly lawn, nothing special. There was a random ledge of grass before a chain fence which separated our garden from some woodland. Later on, a wooden fence was installed. However, I vaguely remember the green chain fencing and the concrete posts. It was a nice day, and Dad was doing some gardening. I was, uh, I was little, sat on the grass. I do not know where the rest of my family were. Dad had to run into the kitchen. He said he only left me unsupervised for a few minutes whilst he got a drink. However, on his return, he found me sat surrounded by frogs. Not one or two, but he said there were hundreds. Ironically, there were no ponds in our garden, our neighboring gardens. Where they came from, he didn't know. I was just swooped up and taken in whilst eventually the frogs then disappeared. As I said, more things have happened since. My most common occurrence is deja vu, dreams coming true, and a weird connection to animals, knowing almost instantly if they are ill. Although I do not remember the story myself, it is too weird for my dad to make up or ignore. P.S. Love the podcast, signed Louisa. Well, thank you, Louisa. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know exactly what to say on this. Well, you're talking about animals, and I have no idea what the motivations <laughs> of animals are. Uh, have you considered veterinary medicine, though? If you actually do have that kind of weird connection, knowing what's you know that an animal is ill, that would be a great place for you to be if you're not already uh, studying for it or already in it. Uh, I think we've all had deja vu. I'm guessing you you have it more often than others otherwise you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't bring that up uh, dreams coming true somewhat common for for people that are closer to the paranormal it's never happened to me which is a good thing because i don't think i'd want any of the dreams that i have uh coming true um, but anyway thank you very much for the story i appreciate it and if you ever figure out what it is about those frogs let me know. I know it's rained frogs and fish in the past but you you didn't get rained on or anything they just showed up out of nowhere weird. Um, maybe it was the curse. There was the, there was the biblical curse of the frogs. Maybe you were being cursed. Kidding, kidding. All right, this one uh, comes from Trish. She says, I'm not a believer in the supernatural or demonic possession, any of it. I believe in science and proof, but I am a weirdo and I do have a few experiences I have yet in which to come up with an explanation. I don't feel it's story worthy, but want to tell you about it. Backstory, I buried one of my identical twin sons, followed six weeks later by their father. The day after his death, I found out I was expecting and he was born on his dad's birth date. I raised my kids by myself in an old home with very creaky stairs. I was in the kitchen and heard the steps squeaking and went to tell the boys not to play on the stairs. I rounded the corner, saw no kids on the stairs, and remembered they were with Graham and Pap. Stairs don't just squeak without applying pressure. There was nothing there to put weight on the steps. Another time, I heard the pitter-patter of little footsteps running up uh, up the same staircase. No kids at home that day either, and no pets. I was the only one home, and both these incidents caused me to investigate and check on my kids who weren't there. I still don't know what caused the noises to this day that my surviving children often made when at home. I only told this to a select few, and it's suspected that it's the twin that did not survive watching over and playing with his brothers. Neither of my boys ever mentioned anything to cause me to think they were being visited by their dead brother. I even asked the surviving twin if he felt part of him was missing or empty or felt any residual effects of his twin. He just shook his head. Thanks for hearing me out, signed Trish. <sighs> I am really sorry. Uh, did you guys hear that? Wow. Um, car passing by. Uh, really, really loud. Um, I'm very, very sorry, Trish, to hear uh, about the death of your son. I know it's probably been a long time now that this happened, but I'm very sorry to hear about that. Um, not being a parent myself, I can't even begin to fathom what kind of uh, sadness 
um, that would break. Uh, I, I, I can't pretend to, to know that. Uh, my dad said it to me often. Until you have kids of your own, you won't understand. And I won't have kids of my own. I, it's just it's not in the it's not in the cards for us. It's, it's, that, that wasn't part of our plan. So I just have to believe that it is bad for people when it happens. Um, as much as I think I would probably be hurt, I, I will be hurt if, if uh, God decides to take my wife home before me. Um, I can't imagine it being an actual child that God would be taken home because you're not supposed to outlive your children. So Trish, I'm very sorry to hear that. I don't have an answer re regarding your, your stairs. Um, I don't know if it's... I still struggle back and forth when it comes to actual ghosts, like actual spirits of the dead type of thing. Uh, different ghosts, depending on what they are, you know, like poltergeists, I can I can kind of buy into that being more more psychically linked. Um, I can I can buy into the uh, the stone stone tape theory, uh, where it's kind of like a recording of something that's happened in in your house or the location or whatever, and it's just kind of replaying for some reason. Um, I think that's probably a scientific thing that just hasn't been explained yet. And so we don't see it as scientific yet. I think maybe that's what it is. But to actual dead visiting you, I still I still struggle with. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I, I, it can go either way. There are moments in the Bible where actually that does happen. So, uh, But I don't know if I would necessarily buy that for every paranormal situation. Um, so I... I don't know, especially with the with your kids. Kids normally being the ones who would see, yeah, spirits before the before the adults in the house, and yet they gave you no indication that they were. So I don't I don't know. Um, but thank you very much for sending in your story. I do appreciate it. Well, let's see. This one comes from. Uh, okay, uh, Ellie from Ellie. I think this probably happened about 25 years ago. I loved McDonald's coffees, so I go there daily for my caffeine fix. This time I'd go for lunch. I ordered a Happy Meal complete with toy and coffee. I got down to the business of writing. I can't remember if it was a poem, story, but I did love to write. My food came, and when I was about to bite into my hamburger, I heard, Leave now! The voice sounded urgent. I looked around. No one was near me, so I chose to ignore it. Second attempt at the hamburger. Second cry. I dared to argue with a disembodied voice. What is a, what is another Columbine going to happen? I dared to say. No answer. I shrugged and tried to get at least one bite of leave now. Heck, maybe that's what caused some of my hearing loss. Fine. I packed up my food and went out to my car. While driving home, I grumbled that my food was getting cold, and by the time I got home, I wouldn't even want the cold mess. Wasted money. Big sigh. I was nearing K Street and happened to notice a wallet lying on the street. I backed up the car, picked up the wallet, and pulled over, parking on K. Opening the wallet, I found plenty of money and credit cards inside, but I wasn't searching for that. Mr. L had lost his wallet. He'd probably fall into his knees in prayer, and God had sent one of his workers to answer that prayer. Yes, he works in mysterious ways. Mr. L lived on K Street. Easy fix, I thought. Boy, was I wrong. I went to the house. His grandsons were home, but he wasn't. I couldn't leave with the wallet. I gave them the wallet and told them to tell their granddad that I had found it on the street. Jump forward ten years. It always bothered me that I didn't hand over the wallet to Mr. L. All those years, I felt it was that the, uh, the story that... Uh, all those years, I felt it was... The story he had to hear, the wallet was not as important as the story of how he got it back. So finally I went back to where I thought he'd lived. Yes, lived. I got there six years too late. He passed away, never hearing that amazing story. His daughter-in-law told me that he never would have fallen to his knees in prayer. The man was an atheist. Was that why he needed to hear the story? To believe before leaving this world? I'd failed him. I was so sad that of course I went to McDonald's to sadly drink a cup of coffee. Why are you so sad? A man asked. I hadn't even noticed him sitting next to me. I told him the whole story. He shook his head and said the call was never for Mr. C, but to me. He wanted to know that I'd always be there to answer when he needed me. Turns out the man who had sat near me was a preacher. Ellie, I, I tend to agree with the preacher. Uh, sometimes 
uh, God will call us to do something, and it's not for the person we're doing it for, but it's for us. Sometimes it's uh, sort of a test of faith to see that we that we do we will walk the walk we say that we will walk. Um, sometimes there's a lesson that we personally need to learn through the process, even if we are helping somebody else by giving of ourselves. There's still lessons that we can learn of, on our own. Um, I've, I've uh, heard it a few times when somebody gives money to somebody on the street and they'll be told, you should never do that. You should never give them money because they're going to go out and buy alcohol or, or whatever, or drugs with it or whatever. But if God's calling you to give it, there, there's, there could be two reasons. One, it could be because that person really does need the money and they are going to use it in a way that they should. Or it could be you need to give the money because you have an issue with giving money with uh you haven't you have an issue with either looking down on on people who are who are uh, uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for i'm sorry i'm struggling with words today you know who, who are disadvantaged you know, pe people who aren't aren't as advantaged as you are like they're they're in a poorer situation or maybe you have an issue with money and and, and hoarding it yourself that uh, maybe you're greedy um but i mean god might be asking you to give for that reason so yeah, there, there's more than there's more than one reason to help somebody. Um, it's not necessarily just for them, but that doesn't say that 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 doesn't mean that that maybe that man wouldn't have changed his mind uh, about God after you visit. But that's not on you. That's not your responsibility. Um, no, no, no one is without excuse. Everybody knows the truth. They've heard the truth. It's just whether or not they choose to believe it. I'm sure if he's an atheist, then I'm sure he knows the truth because to, to choose to be an atheist means that you've heard the other side and decided that it's not for you. So he's heard it. He, that So somebody's done their job in, in uh, telling him about it. It's not your job to convert anybody. It's just your job to plant the seed and to let people know about it. Um, and I, I think that was already done. So but there, uh, thank you very much for that story. I appreciate it. Uh, this one... Uh, I think is also from Elaine. It looks like she sent in a couple. Uh, like I said, it's been a while since I've done these, so it wouldn't surprise me if uh, there's if I get a couple from from uh, some of you. Uh, she says, a very long time ago, I was driving down a busy highway when I came upon an old truck that was going much slower than my, than, uh, my 60 miles an hour. I slowed down, but when I noticed that things were periodically flying out of his truck and smacking my car, I put on my left blinker to move to the next lane. No stay there, something said in my mind and heart. So I stayed in the lane, slowing my car by taking my foot off the accelerator. I was going way under 50 when I took the off-ramp onto Highway 37. I put my foot on the brake and gasped as my foot went all the way to the floorboard. I was in a dire situation. I was driving on a highway that had no shoulders, in a car that had no brakes. For years, I thought I only drive five miles without um, that I only drove five miles without brakes. Boy, was I wrong! Years later, I drove that same path. It sure does have shoulders now, but back then, all the 18 miles I drove had only one shoulder, and that was near the next town. That was the shoulder I used to stop my car. I saw the light in the distance turn red, and as I sped up on it, I pulled onto the shoulder and pumped my brakes like crazy until they finally caught and the car stopped. So two emails from you, both with a voice of God telling you to do something. That is incredible, Elaine. That is amazing. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever shared it on the podcast before, uh, but most people, uh, they they say they heard from God. It's it's a feeling, right? It's not uh, it, it's not literally hearing the word of God uh, or hearing His voice. That is, but I it did happen to me once. Um, I I do believe I truly did hear God's voice, and I was in my early twenties, I think. I had just started working in Christian radio. Been in it a couple of years. Uh, still living at home uh, with my mom, and I was woken up in the middle of the night with a loud voice in my head saying, Hebrews 5.12. And I thought, okay, that's weird. Okay. I was I was not much into reading the Bible back then, except for, you know, the New Testament here and there, and 
um, you know, listening to sermons that that were on the radio, stuff like that. I, it was I was still really new in my faith. At least I thought thought I was. Um, but I really didn't pay much attention to that. I thought, okay, it's just a weird it's a weird thing that happened to my mind. So I laid my head back down to go back to sleep. And a few minutes later, I wake up again. I was asleep. Woke up again with a loud voice saying Hebrews 5:12. I once again put my head back down. The third time it happened, I realized maybe I am supposed to look in the Bible. I didn't even know at the time if Hebrews 5:12 was an actual verse. I didn't I knew so little about the Bible. I didn't know if Hebrews had five chapters, right? So, I open my Bible and I find Hebrews 5:12. It said for when for the time, well actually, let me let me give you, uh, that's the KJV version. I don't want to give you the KJV version. Let me give you the NIV version, because that's actually the Bible that I had at the time. The NIV version said, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. I took that to mean that I had been a Christian long enough that I should be telling people about the gospel. I should be in a position now that I know more than I actually do, that I've been lazy in my faith, and I needed to get back to basics. I needed to go back, figure out what do I believe, why do I believe it, start building up again. Because I should be a teacher by now, but I need to go back to milk, not solid food. Um, it, that may not mean much to, to somebody else, but when when God says it to you, three times really loud uh, waking you up, then yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's it's definitely the real thing. Uh, all right, let's move on here. Let's go to uh, Sherry. She says, Darren, Happy New Year! Yes, I got this actually, I received this on January 1st. That's how long it's been since we've done a Fireside Price. She says, Darren, Happy New Year! You were telling stories about usually men who were infected by a Wendigo. One, uh, one asked his own daughter to cut his head off before he hurt someone. She cut his head off because her dad loved her and the family. He was losing control and knew it. My Wendigo story isn't paranormal stuff unless you believe deerfly lava are, uh, excuse me, deerfly larvae are evil spirits or fae or that doctors in the 1970s and 80s cared about desperately poor people. Here it is. It's ugly. I had tried, uh, uh, excuse me, I had a friend whose father progressively became the creepiest guy in northern Illinois. Adults, farm families, told their kids to avoid him. Eventually, he was sent to Chester, Illinois, to a hospital for the criminally insane, where he eventually died. Then, they looked at his brain and found out why this man became a very twisted cannibal and in, and in uh, twisted cannibal and no one was safe from this fellow. You might as well say he had been infected by a Wendigo. Extensive brain damage caused by a larva that somehow got into his bloodstream, lodged in his head, and he died. Oh, excuse me, the larva lodged in his head and died. A stupid larva destroyed his judgment and sanity. And yes, he did try to kill and eat humans, but everyone in township could see where this was going. He killed his son's horse and laughed when the son came home because he was eating the horse raw. It's taken me far more than 30 years to come to terms with the truth and can't imagine how horrible that must have been for the son. I'm not sure I'll ever finish processing this or any other ab uh, abnormal psychology trauma crap that I've seen in the last 60 years. I suspect any lingering incorporeals won't visit because I'm weirder than they are and I've lost patience with people, living or dead, animal, vegetable, or mineral, who, uh, who try to waste my time. I'd rather not explain that to my counselor, thank you. Uh, these are There are all kinds of reasons for people to feel depressed. This should not be one of them. It is a, it's cathartic to put into words. You are a light in the dark. I'm trying to be. Blessings for you and your family. I appreciate your Bible verses and other uplifting quotations. I won't stop trying if you don't. Sorry, I'm not going to stop until I'm told by the I am to shut up and leave. My kindest regards, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. That's, that's a great way to end it right there. I'm not going to shut up unless the I am tells me to shut up. That's very good. I love that. Only God's going to have to tell me, otherwise I'm going to keep on doing it. I like. Let me, let me get a sip here of my drink and then we'll continue. That is so, so sad about that guy in the larva. Scary too, yeah. I mean, that's that's horror movie material 
right there. I can understand why it would trigger depression or, or some other mental illness uh, for the people around him. And I, well, obviously for him himself, but the people around him just dealing with that. To see, to see somebody that probably started off as a normal human being slowly morph into that, that's, that is dark. That is so dark. That, but that's, that would definitely be a good story if somebody wanted to write it. Um, wow. Okay, this one comes from uh, Jeremiah. He says, I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Uh, this happened several years ago, 2006, while I was serving as a tribal police officer for an unnamed tribe in the Oklahoma area. Well, before I go on, uh, thank you for your service there. Um, Jeremiah, appreciate it. Uh, he says, I was assigned as the supervisor for the swing shift, and on this night I was fairly busy responding to a number of calls for the tribe and county. My jurisdiction was a large rural area across several counties in Oklahoma. A lot of my travels through the area were on dusty gravel roads, which coated my black Crown Victoria police car in dust everywhere. <laughs> I do remember those Crown Vicks. The police loved the Crown Vicks there for a long time, didn't they? Uh, one of our tasks for the tribe was to do a walkthrough of the complexes and check for open doors at the tribal admin and health center buildings. This was to check to make sure the tribal employees did not leave doors open and to document which departments were checked and second uh, unsecured, that is, during our shift. This was required of evening and midnight shifts to accomplish before the end of their tours of duty. The South Complex was older, with older buildings that had previously served as the Tribal Health Building, with morgue drawers now converted into a Tribal Administration Building. This old complex also had the traditional Tribal Burial Ground slash Cemetery. Traditional funerals and burials were still held at this burial ground, directly behind the gym slash community center. The North Complex was new and had a new health center, Head Start, new Tribal Admin, uh, and a court and police building. I started my checks toward the end of my shift, close to 11 p.m. on the south side complex first. I'd sat parked after conducting my checks and filling out my daily log and other reports. I headed north and found a few doors open at the admin building on the north complex. If we found a door open, we would clear the building and ensure nothing was disturbed or out of the ordinary. We would generate a simple one-page narrative report detailing the open door and put it in the captain's door for the next day. Once I found an open door in the South Complex and cleared the building, I had a police-issued flashlight mag light, as my only light source to clear the building. As I got to the morgue area, I started feeling a sense of dread and then heard a loud thump. I jumped out of my skin until I realized it was the time clock marking the increments. After I completed my reports in the car, I went to the police department and parked out front. On my way inside, I remembered my clipboard with the reports. I went back to my car and froze as I went to the passenger side. On the passenger side of my window, there were many tiny handprints in the dust, like children peeking into my car from the passenger side. There were several sets of hands and possibly face smudges. This was impossible, as I had been busy driving around all night. I had not been on any calls where any children were present. Both complex areas were uh, gated and locked. The prints were fresh and unmistakable. Although it was August and hot and muggy that night, and I was wearing a bulletproof vest and all my police gear, I instantly got a chill run through my back and all the hair on my neck and head stood up. At the time, I had no kids and parked my car on the passenger side against a hedge. I was able to take a few photos with my, is uh, with my issued disposable Kodak camera. The photos actually turned out but have since been lost. Oklahoma tribes have many legends of little people scattered across. I wondered if it was them, curiously watching me fill out my logs after checking the building or the ghosts of long-dead children haunting the South Complex. I always wonder what I would have seen if I had looked up and over to the passenger side. I don't get scared easily. I served as a U.S. Marine for eight years and have been alone in the dark many times as a Marine and a cop. Signed, Jeremiah. Wow, a cop and a Marine. Well, Semper Fi to you, man. Thank you so much for your service. I appreciate that. That is really, really cool. Creepy as well. I agree. I agree. But it's um, I kind of like the idea that those children, just off the top of my head as I was reading it, uh, it almost kind of felt to me like the children were 
looking into your vehicle because they were thankful for you being there to protect those in the village or those in the in the in the tribal area. Um, they they you may not be able to protect them anymore because they're gone, but they can appreciate what you're doing for their families and friends. Um, that was just my initial thought, but uh, thank you very much for sending that in. I appreciate it. Okay, this one comes from we'll just say the um, A from Wisconsin. Um, she says I thought he or she says I thought I'd submit a few more stories as I've got plenty to share. One, the first one takes place several years ago. A dear friend of mine lost her husband tragically. He was a lover of all things Lego, so much so he had a shed on their property solely for building with Legos. That is, that's a guy dedicated to a hobby. I like that. He says, uh, she, uh, they say uh, every shape, size, color, and set you can imagine was in there. He even once built a Lego model from a picture he had. Needless to say, he was amazing with those things. A few days after the funeral, myself and his friend took our other friend to the airport. They dropped me off at home first. As I'm crossing my front yard, I see a bright red Lego in the green grass, just laying right in the middle of my yard. We all cried and smiled, knowing it was him saying hi. A few months go by, and my son, three years old at the time, kept talking about the man who likes to play Legos with him. A few months go by, I'm at work, walking to my car at the end of the day, look down to my driver's side door, and there is a blue Lego in the middle of a parking lot. No daycare center or kids' playground, yard, or anything in sight. I'd like to think it's his way of saying hi. Second story takes place around the same time as my first one. My son was three or four at the time. We were at my husband's aunt's house for a July 4th barbecue. Her husband, my husband's uncle, had passed a few years prior at that point. My son and I are in the main bedroom, sitting on the bed, due, uh, due, to, a, due to it was the only room with air conditioning, and it was really hot that summer. My son turns towards the door and says, Hi, Dave! Keep in mind, I wasn't pregnant, nor were we seriously thinking about starting our family when Dave passed away, so my son never met him, much less knew his name. The last story I have to share happened over the several years I was working in the office building that my cubicle was housed in well before COVID had us all working from home. It's not a very old building, maybe built in the 1950s, however, there is a cemetery that was relocated near the building. In each corner of a hallway, were these oval-shaped mirrors so you could look at it and see if anyone was coming around the corner so you didn't smack right into them. On several occasions, I'd slow down and move over because I'd see someone in the mirror, only to get around the corner and no one in sight. A few times, I'd be in the restroom, several stalls, not a single stall, hear someone walk in, turn the water on at one of the sinks and the door shut. I'd come out to the sinks to find a one on full blast no one in sight. This happened on such a daily occasion, people started talking about it. Has this happened to you? I think we all thought the same thing. Is it just someone coming in to wash their hands? But when, then why have the water on full blast? Strange, to say the least. I lost count how many times I'd be sitting at my desk, feel a tap on my shoulder, turn around thinking someone had a question, only to find nobody near me. That's all I have for now. Keep up the fantastic work. I'm sorry to hear about your dad passing from what you've shared. Sounds like he is pain-free now. Take care and stay blessed. Signed, A. Thank you, A. Yeah, uh, my dad passed uh, uh, in uh, mid-October. So uh, as we were heading into Halloween, uh, we lost my dad. But it was not unexpected. He'd been uh, suffering for a very, very long time. And um, I don't know if he was in physical pain necessarily, but there was a lot of mental pain there. He was the suffering from Parkinson's and it was sort of taking away his mind and it was it was really tough on the family I think more than him even though I know it was hard on him because he was definitely a man um, of uh, well I'll, I'll say pride but I don't want it to sound negative that way uh, he was very self-reliant he never liked asking for help from anybody um, very stoic man and so for him to have to to, uh, to rely on his wife to help him get into bed, to go to the bathroom, to eat everything. Um, I know that was very humbling for him. Uh, but there towards the end, he was he was struggling just to just to say sentences. It was it was really tough. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, 
I have since heard, I don't know if it's true, um, but I have since heard that if you dream of somebody who has passed away, that that's them visiting you. I don't know if it's true, but I would like to think that because I've actually dreamed about Dad a couple of times. And, they, and they've been good dreams, too. So, um, I don't know what to make about your second story. Uh, about the barbecue that uh, you don't, I don't, you don't mention who Dave is. So I, I don't know what, uh, when, what you said, when, when they, your son turns toward the door and says, hi, Dave. I don't know who Dave is. So I don't know how that relates to that. Um, you may have said that in a previous story, but I, I don't remember that at all. Um, I have that your third story, if you were to take any one of those incidents, like just the water or just the door opening or just the tap on the shoulder um, or just seeing somebody in the mirror than not seeing them, you, know, you could always chalk that up to just my imagination or a glitch um, like in, in a... in in technology, not, not not a glitch in the Matrix type of thing, but uh, maybe like the the, uh, the faucet going on full blast. Maybe somebody did come in to wash their hands and decided not to touch the, touch the faucet to turn it back off. People are rude like that sometimes, and sometimes they'll do it so fast that they'll open that door, wash their hands, and as that door slowly closes, they sneak right back out before they have to open it again. I mean, it, it's, it does happen once in a while, but... You put all of those together and you start seeing a pattern. So there could be something uh, at your work for that. I got to say, though, the Lego story is my favorite. I, I really, really like that. That's That almost sounds like it would be a great kid's story for ghosts. If somebody wanted to write that, um, just... It, it is so cool. I, I like Legos, too. So as soon as you said Legos, I, I'm, I'm nothing like this. I mean, but uh, I don't collect Legos anymore. I haven't played with them in forever, except for when I was with my, you know, with my uh, nephew and we played Legos. But I remember when I was doing school age childcare, when I was in my early 20s, I would be I, I would get there early before the kids showed up and I'd be playing with the Legos just <laughs> just because I loved I loved playing with them. And so when the kids got there, they were immediately say, hey, there's Darren. He's playing with the Legos. Let's go join him. Uh, I could totally see me if I was if I was that much into Legos. I could totally see me coming back and trying to communicate with my family through dropping a Lego here or there. That that that's really sweet, actually. I think so. Thank you very much for that story. I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I told you at the beginning of this episode. If you do have a, a true story that you want to send in, uh, all you have to do is go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. That's where that's what all of these people have done, and uh, you can send it in, and I can use it on a future Fireside Frights episode. All right, uh, this next one comes from Vance. He says, "Hey Darren, talked to you a few times now, so I thought it was high time to give you a good story that I always love hearing my mom tell. I'm not a storyteller, so I'll do my best to paint as good a picture as I can." She grew up in uh, Teleco Plains, which is surrounded by mountains on almost all sides. Wow, that sounds gorgeous. Uh, one evening, her and her group of friends decided to go camping and have a bit of a party for that night. A good handful of them went up to a mountain ride that had a valley just below it. They talked and ate and had the general good time that you do in a group camping situation. Until about a, until, uh, about a, a good ways into the night, they all hear a scream in the woods far off into the valley. One of her friends decided to scream back at it, and that just seemed to just really tick it off. <laughs> <laughs> As she describes it, they then hear a low and loud howling, not a wolf. If you've ever heard the sounds that people record of Sasquatch screams, pretty much that. Then they hear it tearing down the valley and could see the trees thrashing around like someone big was wading through it. Needless to say, my mom and a few others did not want to stay, so they left. But three or four others did stay. The next morning, the coolers had been completely destroyed all remaining food and drinks either clawed at or gone, their sleeping bags shredded, but the people left untouched as if to say, yeah, this is what I can do, stay away. It's your guess as good as mine what it was they encountered that night on the mountains, but my mom hasn't really camped since. If she did, it was usually in an RV or in a more solid structure. Yeah, I, I, I don't blame her for, uh, for not wanting to go tent camping ever again. Uh, that sounds like a Sasquatch to me, man. That... That is the that's the uh, that is that is quint. It's either that or a bear, but uh, but bears don't screech like that. So if you got the 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 Sasquatch howl, and then you've got uh, and then you've got the uh, 
coming after the food and everything. I would say either either bear or Sasquatch, but I'm going to go with Sasquatch because n- number one because that's more fun, uh, but two just because I don't think bears make that sound. Uh, and all, and really, I think a bear would probably be more scared of you and would probably run a, run off if it was to know that people were around. Um, uh, I don't know. Anyway, a great story though. I, um, funny too. Thank you. Uh, see, this next one comes from Jane. She says. Uh, I truly hope that you, your lovely bride, and Miss Mocha Monster are doing well. It's been a little while since I sat down and sent you a story. I've been getting lost in the world of your podcasts and truly enjoying each one. So I sent you a huge thank you for all you do. Uh, so I send you a huge thank you for all you do. It takes time, talent, and such dedication. Well, well before I go on, thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. For those who don't know, Miss Mocha Monster is our cat. Uh, Calico, little kitty. She started off as just Mocha. Um... That's, uh, I, I named her Mocha. It's it's actually my first pet ever. Here I am, 55 years old, and uh, at the age of 50, I finally get my first pet. Um, and so I named her Mocha. And then uh, then uh, Robin said, no, 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 no. We're going to call her Miss Mocha. But then we, then we got to know her personality. And then suddenly it was Miss Mocha Monster. So <laughs> it depends on what mood she's in. When she gets into Psycho Kitty mode, it's definitely Miss Mocha Monster. Um... So anyway, all right, continuing on, uh, Jane says, uh, I thought I would send you a couple stories about the house that my mother and I lived in when I was a teenager. I shared a story with you about it before, the one where my hairspray ended up uh, uh, in a different room when I was getting ready for a Halloween party. The house had been converted into four really big apartments. Here's my first story. When I was in high school, I'd always sit in the family room and finish getting ready to leave for school. I would use my mother's makeup mirror and put it put in my earrings and barrettes or whatever I would use for my hair that day. But the apartment or whatever was in the apartment beside me would like to hold me up. You see, when I would put down my earrings or barrettes or whatever accessory I had, they would never be where I put them. I would sit down on the floor in front uh, I would sit down on the floor in front of the mirror that was placed on an end table and put the accessory on the table right beside the mirror. When I would reach for that particular item, it would be in a totally different place, or be gone altogether. One particular day, I was running a little late, but still had to finish my hair. I had a pair of barrettes in my hand. I was sitting on the floor, in front of the mirror, and I went to reach for my barrettes, and this time they were just gone. This had been going on for a while, and I guess at this point it didn't really occur to me to be scared. I was just plain mad. So before I left for school, I yelled, I don't care who or what is here, I want my stuff back, and then I left for school. When I came home that day, every item that had disappeared was sitting in the middle of the coffee table. My second story is more on the weird side. Oh, I like your first story wasn't weird? Okay. Uh, When I was in school, I had a very good friend and we would talk to each other all the time on the phone, regardless how much we would talk at school, regardless of how much we'd talk at school. I remember those days. Oh yeah, you talk a lot at school and then you had to call each other later that night, I get it. Um, I'd always sit in the kitchen and use the phone in that room. It was the typical 80s phone that hung on the wall with a very long cord that would reach out into the hallway. One day I was sitting at the kitchen table thinking about calling my friend when I went to pick up the phone. I heard my friend's voice on the other end of the phone. I hadn't even dialed her number yet. I didn't hear a dial tone, I just heard my friend's voice. She was saying, hello, hello. When we started talking, she said this was really weird. She had picked up the phone at the same time thinking about calling me and didn't dial my number either. It was really kind of freaky, but cool at the same time. Again, thanks for letting me share. I love hearing all the podcasts as well as the stories others have shared. I truly love this great family. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. I have to share that my daughter bought me a t-shirt from your store for Christmas. Oh, how cool. Uh, She got me the Future Ghost t-shirt, and I absolutely love it. Hugs. Jane. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. And please give your daughter a big hug for me. Thank her for uh, shopping the Weird Darkness store and getting you that t-shirt. Um, that's not one of the most popular shirts. I really thought that would be a great design, that people would really love it. Um, but it's not one of the it's not one of the more popular ones. So I think you've got a unique shirt there, uh, the Future Ghost shirt. Uh, the, the whole phone call thing. When at, at first I was thinking, well, of course... Uh, of course you're talking to her. She had dialed you. It's just it hadn't rung yet, and so you picked it up too early. That's all. But when you say that she didn't dial either, so you were connected 
through the phone line without either one of you dialing the other's number. You just both picked up the phone at the same time and you were there. That is, you're right. All right, you're, you, you are, you are correct in that the second story is more weird. Uh, I will, I, I will grant you that. That is very, uh, very strange. And I, I don't think there's any, there, there's no way you can explain that. If nobody dialed the number, how, how do you explain that? I don't think there's, I don't think there's a technical glitch that can make that happen. That's, uh, that is really weird. Um, and as your first, for your first story, that's, that is total poltergeist right there. Uh, and which would not surprise me, you were in high school. That's about the time the poltergeists uh, end up causing problems. When you're going through puberty, uh, that is typically when a poltergeist will appear, usually around that, you know, that uh, son or daughter, you know, boy or girl in the house uh, that is going through puberty. That's 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 why that's why a lot of people tend to think it's not a ghost, that it could be uh, psychic in nature, that they're. There could be a, a, a psychic connection allowing for telekinesis and stuff like that as you go through those changes in life. You don't know you're doing it. You're not. You're not. You're not doing it intentionally. You would. You have no idea how to control it, even if you wanted to control it. It just happens. Uh, but that's why. That, that's why it doesn't surprise me that you would be in high school going through all of that, dealing with that. So yeah. All right. This next one. Um, Actually, I think, let me see, sending it to, please do not use my name. Okay, all right, so we'll just say it's anonymous. Um, when I was younger, my parents had moved to a really old but really fancy two-story house. Well, we had lived there for, uh, at the very least, two years before anything paranormal happened. I was coming home from school, my mother was at work, and my dad was taking my younger, uh, my younger sibling to the doctor's. So I was going to be home alone for a few hours. Well, as soon as I got home, I heard a loud bang. I thought of it as, oh, it's just the cat. I go to my room and I did what I normally do, lay down on my bed. And just laying there staring at the roof, I had a headache because just a week before I had broken my glasses in a basketball game, but that's not very important. I went downstairs to get a snack and where I had put my bag, my bag was open and the gun by the gun? You have a gun by the door. Oh, that's okay. That's fun. A uh, gun by the door had disappeared. I just shrugged and grabbed my, my uh, snack and left back to my room. I have had many things go missing or moved. Heck, I've had my porcelain dolls fall, giggle, and also move from places my sister or brother would reach. We never found the missing gun, never found out what the Big Bang was. We also never got rid of the dolls, which they have never stopped making noises or moving. Do you have advice? All right, hold on. So you've, you've never found the gun, um, you never found out what the Big Bang was, and you never got rid of the dolls and they have never stopped making noises or moving. Well, that would be the that would be the second thing I would take care of. The dolls, I think, would be the second thing I would look at. My biggest concern at first is, you don't know what happened to the gun? Have you called the cops? If you have a gun that's missing, if, if you don't know where your gun is, and you know where you put it and now it's gone, whether you think it's a ghost or somebody who broke in, Either way, you call the cops to tell them you have a gun missing. Um, because if that gun is used in a crime later on, they might be able, depending on how you got that gun to start with, they could track it back to you and you'd be a suspect. So you call the cops and tell them you have lost that gun. Um, if it's a shotgun, I don't think you can do much about it, but still you need to tell them that just, just so it's on the record, just in case. Um, Big Bang, that could be anything. You never know what a Big Bang is going to be. I've I've woken up and from a Big Bang, and it's actually exploding head syndrome. Um, you can look that up on my website, exploding head syndrome, and you can learn a little bit about it about that there. But essentially, it's just a Big Bang you hear in your head, and it wakes you up. Uh, it's not really an actual sound. Um, kind of like uh, hearing God's voice, Hebrews five twelve that I mentioned earlier. I, don't, I, I doubt seriously it was audible to anybody else, but it was definitely audible to me. Um, now, for the dolls that you still have, from what I'm reading this correctly, you still have the dolls and they're still making noises and moving, if, if, is that what you're, if that's what you're saying. I don't know how old you are, so I don't know if you are like our previous, uh, previous letter writer where you might be a teenager uh, or, a, or a young adult and maybe this could be a poltergeist situation. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how, how long... 
I don't I don't think you said in this how long all of these things have taken place. I don't know if it was just a couple of years or if it's been over decades. I I, I don't know. Um, if it's been only a couple of years and you are young, or if there's somebody else in your house that's young that could be going through that puberty stage or around that age, then I might chalk that up to poltergeist activity. Uh, so if not, if it's been many years, everybody's an adult, everybody's gone through all of that, then I would probably call call like a, a priest or, or somebody to come in. Um, if, you, if you want to, you could call in paranormal investigators. I don't know what they're going to do for you. I think um, quite often if you bring in a paranormal investigator, they might tell you what they think you have, but I don't know if they'd actually... It depends on whether or not you want to get rid of it, I guess. Um, me, personally, though, I would, I'd go towards the religious side of things, just because of who I am and, and what I believe. Uh, but either way, get, grab an expert. There we go. We'll just put it that way. So if you want to go secular or religious, either way, I'd grab an expert and get their advice on that. Um, after they have, I, I can give you, I can't give you the advice that you'd want because I'm not there. I, I haven't experienced it myself, so I can't tell you what I think it is personally. I've, I've get, just given you a couple of theories, but I'd call in somebody who knows what they're doing and get them to maybe stay the night in your house. Hopefully they'll experience that so they can come up with some sort of explanation. Uh, okay, this next one comes from, uh, this one's a little bit longer. Let me get a sip uh, of my drink here first before we move on. I think we're going to be here for a while tonight. I have no idea how long this is going to be. But I, th I don't think we're even at the halfway point yet. All right. <clears throat> okay, so this one, um, I'm looking, uh, submitting a story. Okay. I'm going to... All right, this person, his name is Tanet. Darren, I've been listening to your shows for the past week. Now, this is from February 5th, so hopefully by now, uh, Tanet is still listening. So, three months down the line. Is that right? For March, April? Yeah, three months down the line. Um, I've been listening to your show for the past week. I thank you for quickly responding to me when I asked about submitting a story. However, I am now a bit leery of doing so. Before I go any farther with this, I want to thank you for professing your faith and all of your other good works – anti-suicide, depression, even crisis pregnancy. Darren, after listening to you, I realize I have probably had an even more unusual life than, I, uh, take, than I've taken into consideration. I have had many, many experiences. I know that we are all spiritual beings and that there are many things unknown to us or hidden from most people mainly because we're told that it isn't true and are distracted away from listening to our instincts. I've also believed that, like some of us have stronger senses of smell, taste, etc., some people's spiritual senses are stronger. I never considered myself more sensitive, but unlucky or even a target. Why? I do not know, but in my 69 and a half years, I did not realize just how many different types of experiences that others have not. Just as I've always been shy about telling anyone everything, or to most people anything, as I have never been believed by strangers, no matter their own experiences or asking for stories, I wanted to tell stories to you. Indeed, I wish you lived next door, but I can't flood you with so many different things that have happened. I will be transparent. I am something of a writer. I've seldom been published, and not in a while, except with friends online. My writing said, uh, had been were religious poetry and nonfiction articles. I simply do not have the drive to push for my other writings to be published, and family has taken my time and energy. I'd never tell you a story that was not true or embellished, as it isn't necessary. I have people who will read my stories, and many of my friends are writers and publishers. If I tried harder, I could get published, at least in something small. This is not why I am taking your time here, and maybe I'm taking up too much of it, You've helped me with your posts and podcasts, etc. Maybe I just wanted to tell you that. I'm now rambling and will n not go back and edit because although I will cringe badly after I send this and read it, I wanted you to know that this is a conversation. The smaller stories that you have read that happened once to people are amazing to me since so much has happened to me. I'm listening to now you talking about shadow people, and yes, I have encountered them on an in-law's property when he and his brother told me that they had seen them, and they were there at twilight while we were there. I'd always been afraid of shadows anyway. Why? I've always experienced things disappearing and reappearing, 
so much so that my husband started telling me to stop looking for things and wait for them to come back, which they do, sometimes right away, sometimes years later. The most recent story is what I was going to send. It was about documents that disappeared, searched for many times, replaced, then the replacements disappeared, to have the originals show up years later and those disappeared almost immediately. If my husband had not seen them, I would doubt that I had not dreamed it or doubt even my sanity. The document replacements are nothing like the originals, by the way. I will risk telling you that I have seen UFOs, one involving a mothership that my own mother called me to see more than 50 years ago. I've had cold hands on me. I've had warm hands on me. I've seen angels. I have seen what can only be described as the Grim Reaper, and my sister, who is not spiritual, experienced both with me at our mother's deathbed, along with other people. She sensed them. I saw them. I saw people I'd never seen before and look forward to finding out who they are when it's, time, my, when it's my time to go. I felt pulled away at night as a kid, which I always fought. What that is, I do not know. Maybe I'll hear about that when I hear more of your, of your podcasts. Seldom have I ever been any place where I felt comfortable in every room or every spot in a room. There were vocal sounds out of flowers, a shadow cat in a house where we lived. I've had things thrown at me from nowhere that others saw. My family had a heavy door that was stuck open and more than once it swung close, ge uh, closed gently. My sister and I also found that we experienced someone blowing in our face when we slept in one place, a man who whistled a baby who cried, and most of the above were in one house where we lived for seven years. My mother used to hear something straining to call for help near the old well. Thank God I did not. I've been with others and hearing voices when no one was there, bells when no one was there, sounds of doors opening when they were not, in a place where I worked and others heard these, and I truly think that I encountered a werewolf which I did not believe in until then and tried to talk myself out of, but there was so much more, including the authorities in that town trying to quiet me. I was pushed, heard voices and a loud breaking, smashing noise next to me in place that I needed to finish working in. They were trying to drive me out. Nothing was there to break, but it sounded like a gigantic stack of china or a crystal chandelier dropping, and there was more before that. When I picked up a button, decided not to remove it and put it in a place where it could not come out, then the room went completely cold. I never had that happen before. I thought the person I sensed was there might have uh, not wanted me to take it. I guess I was wrong. I know there's even more, but I'm getting nervous about telling any more of it to you. You may very well think that I am insane or looking for attention. I'm not. I just have family who may or may not always believe me. I don't tell any of them everything. Friends and relatives have not experienced these things and stop me trying to find logical answers after I have exhausted them before I speak and generally dismiss the little I have told them. Thanks for listening, whether you believe it at all or not. Maybe if you hear someone else tell you the same, you may find that there is more to their story, or at least some precedence. I'll be listening to give me a sense that I'm not alone, which is comforting, but I may keep finding that I'm even weirder than I knew. God be with you, signs to net. Wow, Tanette, uh, now that you've been listening for three months rather than just a week, hopefully you've reached uh, reached some of the other Fireside Fright episodes, because you are not alone. There are, there are so many people that deal with a myriad of strange, odd, so sometimes, well, often scary things in their lives that they can't explain, and I can't explain either. Uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I don't. A lot of people think that I am because I have the podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm a voice artist. Is really all I am. I mean, you can ask my opinion, and I'll give it to you. But I don't. I haven't studied all of this stuff to really. I don't have a degree, you know, in all of this. Um, it's just that I tell a lot of other people's stories, so I just I kind of get soaked in it, and I can kind of come up with my own opinions. But again, they're just my opinions. Uh, the, the werewolf story really strikes out at me uh, because I know people are going to say that it's not true, that you're, that you're stupid for thinking it because werewolves don't exist, and I would tend to agree with them, but I had a friend, I think I've told this 
before. Um, but I had a friend. I, I, I've worked up until recently, until I started a Weird Darkness, and even a few years into doing this podcast, I worked in Christian radio since 1990, nonstop. Uh, that's where that's where a lot of my faith was built from from working in Christian radio, listening to the preachers that we aired, listening to the music that we played, uh, all of that. It was just it was it was a huge influence on me. And so, one of the salespeople at one of the stations that I worked with, I won't say what station or what the person is. Uh, this person has passed away since then, but they uh, they had I think a past. Before they got into, before they got saved, uh, or 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 maybe even shortly after they got saved, but they had friends who were in the occult, and they were at a a gathering. I don't know if it was a party or a séance or what it was, but it was some sort of gathering. And there was some. Um, I think she called it witchcraft or Satanism, and I don't. Again, I don't know which one it is. So please, please don't uh, email me saying, oh, that's not witchcraft or that's not Satanism. Cause I really don't know. OK, I I'm, I'm slowly getting to the point that I want to make. It's just I, I'm trying to set the scene. But regardless, she said that she actually saw one of these people there turn into a monster, into a werewolf. Now, I immediately when she told me I was in my early 20s, I thought I knew everything because oh, don't we all know everything when we are in our early 20s? Um, I said, no way, you're, you're, that's that's stupid. You know, werewolves don't exist. I like werewolves, I like werewolf movies. It's my favorite my favorite uh, movie monster, okay? I love werewolves, but they don't exist. They're, they're they, they, you know, they're made up. Um, and she said, no, no, I saw it. And I actually, I challenged her. I, I was actually, I was telling a coworker that she was lying which is not something that you do. But that, that's how that's how ignorant and egotistical I was back then. I, I thought I knew everything. Uh, but I mean, she got to the point of tears, telling me, no, you don't understand. I really did see this. So I started saying, okay, well, there must have been drugs involved then. Or there must have been alcohol. There must, you must, this must have been something that you, that you know you saw, but maybe it wasn't actually real. Uh, maybe, maybe you were influenced some way in your bloodstream or... You know, with uh, your blood alcohol level or LSD or something along those lines, and, said, and she said, "No, I don't do any of that stuff. I am, I'm always clean." Um, but she did see it, and I tend to believe her now. Now, I'm not going to say that werewolves exist in the way that we think of them from the movies, but she saw something, and I believe her now. Uh, she, she was a woman of faith. Uh, she never lied about anything else that I know of, so why would she lie about that? It would be a very strange thing to lie about, to come out and lie about something so, so bizarre that would obviously be a lie. Why would you start off lying to somebody with that story, right? Because you know it's just, it's so outlandish and out there. There's just no way that anybody would actually take it at face value. Um, but I'm telling you, she was so insistent that that, that it actually did happen. So... All I had to say, Tanette, I do believe that, yes, you did probably see what you think you saw. Whether or not people believe you doesn't matter. You believe what you saw. You know what you saw. And now you can say, I know somebody else who also believes. I can't tell that I can't tell them that I saw what you saw, but I can tell them that I believe you believe what you saw is real. And I have I had another friend who possibly saw the same thing. And those, and you and her obviously have never met. Um, so that I'll, I'll just, I'll put it that way. I am really glad you found the podcast, Tanette. Um, really. Uh, so please, set, don't be afraid to send in your stories and, and, and tell them. I know you were really nervous sending that in, and I can appreciate that. But it was very brave of you to hit that send button. So uh, please send more in. I, I would like to see it. And I'll try to get more Fireside Frights episodes done a little bit faster. I know it's been really, I've been really, really bad about that. All right, uh, moving on to uh, our next one. This comes from Kelly. She says, when my daughter was two years old, she'd always run out of her room and cry sometimes and say that there's a man and woman in her bedroom. I'd go in there and say, no, I don't see anything. At the time, I pushed off my ability to see things, but it continued. 
We could be in the living room, and she would point and say, Mom, do you see that lady right there? I would look and say, No. Well, she did this to other family members as well. There were occurrences in this apartment I was living in. Things would fall off the table that were placed in the middle of the table. Uh, or a, a vase would fall off a shelf. Music would turn on and no one was near the radio. I was, st I, uh, I was starting to believe my two-year-old daughter. Uh, I was starting to get scared. We moved from that apartment, but things still kept happening. My two-year-old would run to me and say, Mommy, a lady is in my room, or a man is in there. She'd always run to my room, so now it was as if someone was following us. We moved again, this time into a house, and the occurrences stopped. Then again, at that point, my daughter was four. I believe she stopped seeing things at that point because she didn't mention them anymore. I started to get more into healing and Re Reiki and my, physical, and my psychic abilities. I was a part of a paranormal group. It was a paranormal society in Rome. Uh, we went... Oh, Rome, New, uh, all right. Rome, New York, I think is what she was saying. Uh, we, went to, we went to this haunted house one evening, and a medium was there, and she was part of the team. I asked her if anyone was around me. She said, yes, it's your deceased grandma and uncle. They've been watching over you and your kids, but most particularly your youngest, because your uncle feels a bond with her and can relate to how she feels, and they both wanted to apologize for scaring her. They only wanted to help. She went on to say my uncle died in a car crash, um, and he wasn't ready to die at 16. She even described how the crash happened. Everything she said was true. She also went on to say that my grandmother did not commit suicide. She was murdered and was worried about me because I was getting into toxic relationships with men. She felt I would die just like she did if I didn't change my ways and heal from things. Everything this medium said was correct. It's nice to know that my daughter saw uh, that what my daughter saw was our family and that they were around us trying to guide and protect us from the other side. Signed Kelly. Thank you Kelly. That's uh Yeah, um at first when I was reading that I was thinking, okay, so the house is haunted. And then when you moved, I thought, okay, well maybe it's not the house, maybe you have a haunted object that uh, you've somehow picked up somewhere from a garage sale, an estate sale, maybe it was a gift from somebody that didn't know it was haunted. Um, so uh, something like that could happen. Um, we have, a, uh, we have a, a grandfather clock in our family that's, that my grandmother is attached to, we're pretty sure. Because everywhere that grandfather clock goes, somehow my grandmother shows up and, um, and uh, surprises people by like, like laying a hand on them in the middle of the night or whatever, mostly just my dad. It was happening to so I don't know what's gonna happen now that he's gone uh, but anyway yeah so cursed objects uh, definitely definitely do exist I believe or haunted objects whatever um, but then you move to the third location and suddenly now it's stopped but you're right your your daughter is a little bit older and we do we do have a tendency to stop seeing these things we are we become, the older we get, the more skeptical we become about what we see. We become more analytical about what we see. We're not so open to any information that comes our way. And so maybe that is, maybe maybe we just she just grew out of it. I, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting, though, that later on, I would think maybe she just grew out of it. That it, it wasn't a cursed, or excuse me, a haunted object. I keep saying cursed, I don't mean that, I apologize. Um, I don't think it was a haunted object. I think she was probably just grew out of it because if the medium is true, if, if, if what she's saying is true, that it's your aunt and uncle, then obviously they are still there. It's just no one is seeing them anymore. So yeah, she probably just uh, grew out of it. Uh, okay, this next one comes from Lori, a very short one. She says, I believe in angels. When I was 15, my cousin was killed in her car. My dad's sister died when I was 20. Cousin and aunt, they could, uh, they could have, oh, okay. Cousin and aunt, they could have passed as sisters. Now for my story. My son was three, and one day he asked me if my dad had any sisters, and then he described the angel that had carried him downstairs to the couch. So I got out of the picture, got out each of their pictures, and he pointed out my cousin as the angel. Please share, I haven't been able to find the link. Um... Oh, okay. I think, yeah, she probably just emailed this directly to me uh, instead of going to the Tell Your Story page. Uh, that's interesting. I My only issue with that, Lori, is 
I, I don't believe, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we turn into angels. Uh, we are saints. Angels were, were created separately from us. We don't become angels when we die. So it could be, what I don't know, um, I used to say, I used to say, no, you can't come down from heaven and walk among the living if you've already died. Um, but the more and more I look into this, the more and more I start to question whether or not that's actually the case. So I wonder now if maybe perhaps your uh, the cousin or aunt uh, came back and you know was was talking with your son. I I don't know. I don't think it was an angel. I think it was probably a saint. I guess because that's what we are. We're really we're not a patron saint. You know, like 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 the Catholic Church. I'm not talking about that. But we are all saints. Um, if we if we die in the Lord, so that's that's what I would say it, it is before I'd say angel. Do I believe in angels? Do I believe they come down? Yes, absolutely, I do. But in your particular scenario, that's that's the only reason I'm I'm pointing that out. Uh, okay, let's see here. Um, this one comes from Daniel. Hold on a second. I want to make sure this isn't something that I should use in the regular podcast. No, okay, this this does belong here. Okay, all right. Uh, it's it's titled Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, so normally if I'd see something like that, I'd think, okay, it's just like an article about the Bridgewater Triangle somebody's sending me that they want me to use. But no, apparently this is a personal experience. All right, let me take a sip of something real quick then. Oh, my throat is so dry after doing all that voice work earlier. I can I can tell my well, I'm getting hoarse now too. <clears throat> okay. So, who, what did I say? Daniel? Yeah. All right. Daniel said th sent this. It's understandable dis to dismiss all the stories about the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts. It's nothing more than urban legend, tall tales, or a good yarn we New Englanders spin for tourists. But man, the Bridgewater Triangle does not disappoint. By far the most frightening experience I have ever had in the Triangle occurred in the late 80s. At the time, I resided in a town which sits at the northern tip of the Triangle. It all started in the summer of 1988. I was 19 years old and finally striking out on my own. I moved into the Raintree Village apartment complex in the town of Abington. There's nothing remarkable about Abington. It's a sleepy, blue-collar town 21 miles south of Boston. At least that's how I found it for a while. The complex itself was not much to look at, just a decaying relic of the 1960s. What's got my attention was the wooded area that bordered the complex on three sides bordered the complex on three sides. At night, the few remaining security lights that still functioned struggled to illuminate the black void of the woods. Little did I know that in the coming days, weeks, and months, I would encounter something I can, I can still, not to this day, reconcile with my mind. The first I encountered the little SOBs. I found myself floating out of my first floor window, down the back of my complex, towards the woods. I could not figure out why. After a second or two, I looked up and completely freaked out. My heart started racing. I was in full flight or fright, uh, excuse me, full flight or fight mode. I could not move and I could not believe what I was seeing. I found myself surrounded by diminutive, pale white creatures with spindly little arms and legs. It was like a slow motion nightmare. When we finally made it to the woods and passed into the black void effortlessly, I was struggling. I wanted to run, but I was stuck like a fly in a web. I wanted to lash out at the little uh, jerks, I'll say that way. And then everything went black. The next thing I know, it's morning and I'm in my bed. For the rest of the summer, I would have periodic late-night encounters with these creatures. The visits were random and followed no logical pattern. The memories of these encounters come to me in flashes like a demented kaleidoscope of terror. My encounters with these entities ended when I moved back to Boston that winter. Over 30 years later, I still have no explanation for what happened that summer of 1988. Well, Daniel, and I'm sure 90% of the people that I am speaking to right now are already thinking it. Say it along with me, everybody. Alien abduction. Yes. that is What you've described here is exactly what alien abduction sounds like. Being frozen getting like a sleep paralysis thing where you can't move at all, floating out a window, the spindly white little creatures, those very very well could have been gray aliens or something similar. They could have been tall whites. There's, there's several different types of 
of uh, alien creatures that have been reported. And then whatever whatever they do, you suddenly wake up in your bed. Um, that's because they have erased whatever memory of that incident that you, you that you had. I and 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 you had periodic late night encounters with these creatures. Again, alien abduction. They often come back and they they re uh, they they revisit victims they'd already taken before. Like they're doing experiments on you, or they're studying you to see what kind of changes are coming across you from what they've done. Who, who knows what their actual motives are? But that is very common with alien abduction cases, that somebody will have that experience, and then they will continue having that experience for some time to come. And the idea that it stopped after you moved makes sense. Uh, now, sometimes sometimes it'll, it'll follow that person to the next place that they move, but in your case, you moved, you were no longer there to be taken, so the incidents stopped. Uh, there is uh, something on the Hope in the Darkness page. If, if you're struggling with this, um, it's the Opus Network, and what it is, it's like uh, it's like psychologists and counselors who specialize in talking to people who have had these types of experiences. They're not trying to explain them away. They're not they're not skeptics. They're not people who are saying, well, here's what really happened and you were just imagined it and it was a bad dream or tell us about your mother. Okay, it's not it's nothing like that. These people actually do believe these stories because most of them have actually gone through this themselves. And so that's how they got started in it to begin with. But they're they're trained counselors and psychologists and they are there to help people kind of start you know start moving forward with their life those, those people who have a hard time dealing with what they've dealt with it's called the opus network if you go to the hope in the darkness page and scroll down towards the bottom you'll find it there uh weirddarkness.com slash hope and then look for the opus network thank you very much daniel i really appreciate you sharing that uh sharing that with us okay this one comes from eleanor hello darren i've only just discovered your youtube podcast um by the way, for those of you who don't know, I'm on YouTube, but it's just the audio. Uh, you don't actually see me talking. Um, so it's exactly like listening to the actual podcast itself. It's just on YouTube. That's all. Anyway, she says, I only just discovered your YouTube podcast. I'm 43 years old, a grieving widow. My husband is 16 years, took his own life two weeks ago. Oh, my gosh. I am so sorry. So sorry, Eleanor. And she, she said this to me on Valentine's Day. Oh, wow. Eleanor. I wish I had seen this earlier. I am so sorry. I uh, can't, especially as young as you are, I can't imagine losing a spouse like that. Uh, moving on. Um, we both love the paranormal, supernatural, and all things. Uh, Janine rattled off to Winston in his job interview scene in Ghostbusters. We were weirdos, but we were genuine, honest, and trying so hard to be happy. Too hard I see now, but I thought we had a plan to get through the bad times. I want to tell you a story. I've lived in two worlds all my life. My earliest memory is of myself as a baby in diapers standing on the table. I did that a lot as a child. I loved climbing up things as most kids. It was at my paternal grandmother's house on a very hot summer night. My father, his brothers, and their friends were all gathered together. I recall watching some creatures in the blackness of the yard. It was so dark out, black as ink. Back then there was only the house the shed, and the old cattle barn, so no light cast out into the yard. These creatures were loping about in the blackness, moving in toward the house. They were as black as the lack of light, but I clearly remember seeing, um, remember seeing, uh, okay, I'm sorry, clearly remember seeing them. Their eyes glowed against the blackness of their coats, and they kept moving nearer. I suppose all children like to point things out and ask, what's that? I once laughed my butt off seeing a father and his little boy in the grocery store as the little guy asked, what's that, to every brand of deodorant on display to his amused father, explaining, that's deodorant too. And I remember pointing out the open door at them, asking, what's that, what's that? Well, the adults replied, that's the door jam. So door jams they were. All my life, what other people call black shucks or hellhounds to me have been door jams. <laughs> I was pointing to something the adults could not see. Three days before my husband took his own life, I saw them, three of them, hopping, uh, yeah, hopping about the tiny area between the fence and the neighbor's house. 
the very precise, very small square footage in front of his bedroom window. We both have uh, severe arthritis and slept in separate beds on account of our bone pain. We're young, but we've always been arthritic. I went into his room and asked him if I'd ever told him about the door jams. He said, they look a lot like Rottweilers, don't they? I wonder who they're here for. We have a number of elderly neighbors, including the lady on the corner who recently had a stroke. We thought perhaps they were there to escort her to the afterlife, or perhaps they were cutting through yards on the way to the hospitals. Three nights later, my husband went to his car on his lunch break and shot himself. He left no note or final words. The door jams weren't something either of us feared, and I even more now believe they protect us at the moment of death and escort us to Shangri-La. I've always practiced magic and had what you say my uh, my uh, the term spirit guides, so I was even further devastated that my husband had not made contact with me. Within about a week, I began to feel his presence again and receive messages from him. My brain still rejects that he is gone and expects him to walk through the door or write me an email, but I know he is safe, happy, and not in pain. I still love him very much, and my God, I am lonely and devastated. Take care and always be gentle with those you love. We never know what pain they're keeping from us and putting on a brave face to hide. Signed. Eleanor, I am really sorry for your loss. I know I said that earlier, but that's the one thing in this life that I think would devastate me most is losing my bride. And especially for you to have no no clue that it was coming, no warning signs. Um, you, if, if they were black shucks, I know a lot of people like you believe that they were um, harbingers of doom, but you didn't know that they were for you or your husband. Um, you just saw them and think, well, yeah, elderly neighbors. I mean, it's about time for one of them to pass away anyway. They're, they're getting to that age. And then for your, your husband to take his own life is just so sad and not leave you a note to let you know why, let you know that he loved you, that it's, it's nothing that you did. Um, there had to be something going on in his mind that made him feel that there was no way out. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the arthritis triggered really deep depression uh, in your husband. I don't know. I know physical Ill illness uh, can do that. Uh, we all, have, you know, when it comes to depression, we all have different triggers, and it's all we all deal with it in slightly different ways. We all have different types of depression. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's chemical imbalances. Sometimes it's emotional. Uh, I I really wish I had an answer for you on that, Eleanor. But I am, uh, I'll be praying for you tonight. I, you may not believe in that. I don't know. You say you believe in magic and um and, and stuff like that. Uh, but if, if you're open to it, well, even if you're not open to it, because I'm not, you're not here to ask. But I'll definitely be praying uh, for you. Um, that, that God will bring you peace that passes all understanding. That uh, he lets you know that that your husband's okay, that you'll be okay, that God will continue to take care of you, that he will guide you in the future steps that you need to take from here on. Um, and feel free to to drop me an email sometime and just don't just don't don't uh don't do it through the tell your story thing. Just say, hey, Darren, it's Eleanor in the subject line or something. And that way I'll know and I can actually reply sooner. Uh, I'm not really good at replying to emails uh, as much anymore just because the show's gotten so big and I get so many of them. But I, I do try. And I certainly like to try it and get back to people before three months have gone by. So uh, thank you very much for just, if nothing else, just for opening up, Eleanor. I really, I really appreciate your bravery to do that. Um, let's see. Rook has sent me a lot of stories. And unfortunately, okay, I, I needed to print these out before starting. Brooke, I'm going to get back to these at, at a, on a future Fireside Frights. I'm sorry. I, I, I should have, if I had known those were the way, way they were, I would have printed them out. Uh, okay, uh, Suzanne sent something in saying, My family has had paranormal experiences as long as I can remember. Almost everyone you asked could tell you 
of an experience that they had, whether good, creepy, or just poltergeist activity. I didn't experience anything until we moved into the apartment before my mother passed away. The day we were moving in, my mother stopped by the steps outside and told me that there was something that they didn't want us there. My only response was, oh well, it's too late now. I would regret saying this later. I was with my mom, uh, excuse me, I was with my now ex-husband talking to her one night when I laid down on an air mattress and my back began burning severely. I immediately jumped, which made my husband pull my shirt up. He yelled at my mom to get a rag because my back had three scratches down, uh, scratches down it and were bleeding. We heard noises in the basement, but upon checking, there was nothing there. The family always felt like they were being watched, and my cousin seen a little girl in the dining room. But the night something showed its, but that night something showed itself. We knew it was time to move. The only way I can describe it is a full-figured black shadow man. Our dog went to the area and ended up yelping like he was injured. We moved within a week of this incident, and I left a believer. I have more stories from our paranormal family. Well, Suzanne, yeah, the uh, the shadow people, the. Uh, the, the dark black shadow man was he wearing a hat he could have been the hat man um unlike ghosts um or angels and saints stuff like that shadow people seem to always be negative there's, there's always no one i've never heard of a positive shadow person story be it be it a shadow person hat man whatever so it doesn't surprise me that something freaky was going on there Okay, this next one comes from Tony. He says, hey, Darren. Uh, you, hi, Darren. I keep saying hey. Um, been thinking about encounters that I've experienced, and upon thinking about them, I could tell you if there were actual encounters if uh, or vivid dreams. I'm going to break these down into two stories since they happened at different ages of my life. Now, most of these encounters happened between 1963 and 1974, so the time period could have something to do with it. Story one. As a small child, I guess between two or three years old, my family lived near Fort Irwin Air Force Base in the state of Texas. It also happened that our home was located at the sweet spot at the end of the Air Force Base runway. My, by a sweet spot, I mean the spot where the Air Force jets broke the sound barrier, which would wake the entire neighborhood with a large bang and shaking every window in the house. My father would always tell my mom it was the price she had to pay for post-housing. Well, now you have the background of the story it's time for the actual story. It seemed that the sonic boom always happened mostly at night, around the time I was put to bed. One night my parents had put me to bed, and I must have just fallen asleep, then out of nowhere there was a loud boom. I pulled the covers over my head, and after a few minutes I poked my head from under the cover and my room uh, was full of what appeared to be creatures of various sizes, but the room was dominated by a large creature with broad shoulders and horns. It looked like a demon, and of course, I went back under covers and started screaming. My father and mother came in to see what was wrong, and when they pulled me out of the covers, everything was back to normal. My parents chalked this off to a chalked this up to a nightmare and ignored my pleas that the monsters were real. Story two: My mom and I moved back to Tennessee, and she remarried. I guess I was four or five at the time. The first house they they bought was on the main street in Brownsville, Tennessee. It was an older house, but it was the best we could afford at the time. My room was huge, and I loved it. I had room for a large bed and all my toys. The only bad part about the room was every morning when I would wake up, my bed was covered with granddaddy log-leg spiders. Every day when I woke up, I'd see nothing but spiders covering my top cover from head to foot. Under the covers, I'd go screaming. My stepdad would come into the room, see the spiders, grab the covers, and shake them off. This lasted for about a year until my parents bought their second house. Story 3. Years after moving into the second house, I just turned 13. I'd never experienced any monsters or spiders like before until one night I'd gone to bed while we were uh, while we were having one of the biggest thunderstorms I can remember. At first, the storm was helping me sleep, but a large flash of lightning and the thunder shook the house and set me under the covers, and while under the covers I seemed to dream that I was walking outside, looking around at the yard. As I regained my courage to come out from the covers, I looked around the room, and even though I didn't see any spiders, I recognized the same large creature with broad shoulders and horns standing next to my bed that I'd seen in Texas. Well, this put me back under the covers, screaming. My mom and my stepdad came in, and after getting me out of the covers, started noting uh, that everything was okay, or 
started... Okay, I'm sorry. When mom and dad came in and, after getting me out of the cover, stated nothing was there, everything was okay, and told me I was fine. But I got up the next morning, and as I went on to put my sho to put my shoes on, I noticed that they were both covered in mud. I went outside later and found footprints leading from the side of the carport to the backyard. They were a match for mine, exactly. I tried to show these to my mom and stepdad, but they said that they had to have been from another time. Even though the mud on my shoes and the ones in the yard were both fresh and we had not had any rain until that night. Well, that's it. After serving in the military and settling in Colorado, I've not had any type of encounter like those again in my life. Love listening to your podcast. Keep up the great work. Take care. Signed, Tony from Colorado. Tony, thank you very much. Appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your service and uh, thanks to your dad for his service uh, as well. Um, Growing up a military brat must uh, must have been quite a quite a trip, even without the paranormal stuff. Um, I would originally think that being two or three years old, it was just your imagination. But as I was reading this, I, I was also thinking that how would a child know to dream up that type of monster? It's amazing that the quite often the they're dreamed of, dreamed of with like they're black, um, like really black, maybe with red eyes, maybe they have horns. How would a child of the age of two or three even have that image in their heads? Unless you raise them around horror movies from the day they were born, how would they even know that? Unless they truly are seeing it. So I, I tend now to believe that little children are seeing something. It's just after a while, as we mentioned earlier in a, in a previous email, people, they just start to grow out of it. So I think maybe you actually did see something. And being associated with the loud boom could have just given them that much more power because you were fearful at that point. And maybe that's what they, maybe that's what they thrive on. Maybe they thrive on fear. And so the loud boom that scared you gave, gave them enough, for lack of better words, power to be able to come to fruition and be able to be seen by you, which might also explain then uh, your your third story when you're 13 years old and you hear the thunderbolt, which is again another big sound boom. It would it would probably that probably took your memory right back to when you were two or three with the sonic booms that you heard in Texas, and so it's it was an opportunity. It was an open door for them to come and show themselves once more. Just, just my, just my first glance opinion. So, I, I don't really have much of a an opinion on the second story about the spiders. I think you just had a really rotten luck uh, when it came to uh, what room you got. Um, I'm surprised. I'm surprised though that your dad would just come in and just shake the spiders off. That's it. That's all he did. I would be armed with a couple of cans of Raid going in there, making sure that place was clean for you the by the next the next night. If not, I would be finding a different room for you. We'd be closing that thing off, barricading it, doing a bug bomb, you know, calling an exterminator, something. For that to happen, like, every night for a long while, there's something, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I have to wonder if you're even, if, if you're remembering that correctly. At four or five years old, I don't know. Um, not, not that you didn't have it. I mean, I'm sure you did have spiders on the bed. But for it to, I, whether whether or not it happened night after night after night after night, I don't I don't know if you're actually remembering that correctly. Because if you are, then that would mean your parents didn't do anything about it, and that that would just be sad. Uh, okay, uh, moving forward. This is uh, do not use my names. Okay, let's call just call her J. She doesn't want me to use her name or any of the names that she uses in this. So I'll have to be careful how I say this. So, me and one of my old friends, um, friend two, uh, or friend one, we'll call her, were having any normal, well, you know, sleepover. Me and her, uh, both being the eight-year-old girls, we are both freaked out when this happened. Most people don't believe us when we say it, not even our own parents, well, uh, for her grandparents. It started off like, okay, I'm sorry. They were both eight years old having a sleepover, and they both freaked out about this. Jay's parents don't believe her, and then apparently friend one was being raised by her grandparents, and they don't believe her either. Okay, now moving forward. 
It started off like any normal sleepover. We came to my house over on a Friday. We played a few games. The ones I remember most is Minecraft and Cat Scratch. It's very well for us. We were. Uh, it is a very well for us. We were just playing it like you would any other game. She had her phone and I had mine too. But my parents don't allow me to have TikTok. But she had it and she showed me this game called Cat Scratch. It looked like a fun game, so I just said, sure, sounds like fun, how's it go? Well, she started off, hmm, let's watch the video. So we did. After that, everything seemed normal, but about 30 minutes later, all the lights in the house, besides the one in my room, went off. Us, being the girls we were, screamed and ran out to my dad who was fixing his work truck. He didn't believe us, but do you, Mr. Marler? Um, I have no reason to not believe you. I don't know what cat scratch is, though. Let me, uh, pull up my phone here real quick. I'm not going to go on TikTok. Uh, I don't have TikTok on my phone. I don't like TikTok at all. Um, cat scratch. I need to type it correctly. Scratch game, I guess. Cat scratch game. Let's see. Face your fears in this popular slumber party horror game. Some. So you lie on. Okay, so you lie on your back on the floor of a dark room with your head in the lap of another player. There, the storyteller. You relax and close your eyes as the storyteller softly rubs your temples and reads one of the cat scratch stories out loud. You sit up when the story is over and you check your back for the telltale red marks. So. Okay, so the, I guess my question at that point was, did you get the red marks? Did you actually go through the entire story? Uh, all the lights in the house went off except the one. Yeah, I, I, I believe you, but I don't know if it's paranormal. I guess it would depend on what's powering that light. Was it battery operated? Or did it have a battery backup for it so that would keep it on? That would be my only question is, how can that one light still remain on, but all the other lights in the house went off? Unless it was a, like a, a breaker situation, and for some reason, the one breaker to your room never did not switch, but all the others did. Uh, I don't know. I believe it happened. I, I do believe you that that had happened. Uh, I just don't have any explanations as to why it happened. Okay, this next one comes from uh, Annie. She says, I want you to know I just listened to my Fireside Frights episode, by far my most favorite episode. Uh, I'd like to submit one of my personal stories for your next Fireside. Well, here we are. Um, this occurred three years ago, and I'm still just as perplexed today as I was then as to exactly what I saw. My husband and I were driving south on US-60 from Wickenburg, Arizona to Surprise, Arizona. It was summertime and well over 110 degrees outside. It was early afternoon and a clear, sunny day. We make this trip bi-monthly to pick up my youngest son for his weekend visits. My husband's retired military and was driving. Well, kudos to your, to your husband to thank him for his service. My husband's retired military and was driving. He's extremely observant of his surroundings when uh, driving. He drives me crazy most of the time, however, that day I was grateful for it. We were passing under the only street light in the town of Whitman and my eyes were on my cell phone. Suddenly he says, what is that? I look up just in time to see a very tall, very hairy creature standing between two cement barriers in the center of the road. The barriers keep cars from driving down into a wash that runs under the road. It had this, its left hand up, shading its eyes, and its hair was blowing around as the vehicles passed by. We were only able to see it for a quick second as we passed by at 75 to 80 miles per hour. Later, when we came back, we looked behind the barrier where it was standing. The ground was two feet below the barrier and dropped down into the wash. It had to have been at least seven feet tall to stand as tall as it had from that low spot behind the barrier. It was standing at an angle, looking north, so we were not able to see it full-on frontal, and the cement barrier hid the creature from the hips down. But both of us knew we had just seen a Sasquatch. I always look at that very spot every time we drive past that light. I have no idea why it was there. It was in the middle of summer and broad daylight. The BFTO told me that they believe the creatures migrate through the state at certain times of the year, but those times are spring and fall, not midsummer. So that is my story. I hope you can use it. I know how it sounds, but I would swear on the Bible it is actually what had happened. Weird Darkness is one of my favorite podcasts, and I think you do an amazing and important job. Thank you for being you and sharing this platform with us all. 
your fellow weirdo in Christ, Annie. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. Thank you for signing that weirdo in Christ, too. I like that some people have actually picked that up after I coined the term. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. But <laughs> I was thinking, okay, so the werewolf, where, where is she going with this? Uh, Sasquatch. So Sasquatch is now working for the uh, for the government, uh, working on highway uh, highway construction. That's that's what he's doing. Was he wearing an orange vest? That's what I want to know, or maybe a hard hat. Uh, freaky, very very freaky. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I would be doing the same thing. If every time I pass that place, I would be my eyes would be glued to that, thinking, okay, am I going to see him again? Am I going to see him again? Um, that's really yeah. I definitely believe you. I. I'm surprised he didn't cause any accidents because you, you said that uh, the other vehicles were coming the other way and you could see his, the the fur uh, waving in the wind from the other passing cars. So nobody saw him and freaked out enough to get into a wreck. That is the miracle of this story. So th thank you very much for sending that. I appreciate it. All right, this next one comes from Josh. Uh, Hi, Darren. Uh, I've just recently discovered Weird Darkness and wish I would have discovered it sooner. Well, Josh, I wish you had too, but I'm glad that you're here now, so welcome to the Weirdo family. Uh, thank you for your consistency in uploading intriguing, spooky, quality content. When I heard you accepted true story submissions, I got pretty excited as our family had been sitting on some weird experiences and no one uh, to share them with. I don't know about a catchy title, so let's go with The Grandparents' Home. All right, yeah, fine, Joshua, let's go with that. Uh, I grew up in a home that was directly adjacent to my grandparents' home, which was also the home my father and his sister grew up in. My father would share bits and pieces with me of weird occurrences that happened in the home as a child, but never in any serious way. I believe he didn't want to frighten me and discourage me from going over to my grandparents' house. When I was a bit older, both grandparents passed away, which had some weird coincidences surrounding that, a whole other story. The guy my dad had hired to do some minor repair work around the house began to act more and more strange each day. After the first few days, he carried an attitude of uneasiness when going into the house to do work and was outside more frequently. One day, he finally broke down and called to my dad on the other side of the fence. My dad walked over to him and the handyman started questioning my dad about other people possibly having a key to the house or if squatters could be living there. This was an old home with multiple floors and a basement. My dad assured him that this was not the case, which seemed to disturb the man even more. Being younger and ignorant to the history of the home, I asked him why he thought there might be people there. He began to tell us about strange occurrences while he was working. Specifically, while he was in the basement, he told us how he would hear on the floor above him footsteps that sounded as someone were walking at a brisk pace, going up and down stairs, in and out of rooms and the like. And then he said they would suddenly stop after he called out, hello. The handyman also talked about hearing strange sounds in the other rooms of the basement, specifically at my grandmother's sewing room and pantry room. The sound of the old pantry doors creaking open and closed and footsteps moving about. My dad was a level-headed man and had a good sense of humor, so I anticipated him to laugh and dismiss the claims. To my surprise, he just told the guy, yep, that's just the ghosts of the house, they've been there forever. Intrigued, I asked my dad more about this because I had never heard him talk about this before or experienced anything like that during my times spent next door at their house, uh, at the home. He told me that my grandparents' home is indeed haunted, for lack of better terms, but he assured me the spirits, ghosts, entities, etc. were harmless. I pressed on for stories and he caved and shared his full experience as a kid and adult. Back when he was in elementary school, he and his sister slept on the third floor. The bathroom was down a narrow, creaky stairway on the second floor. This was the same floor the kitchen was on. He woke up to use the bathroom one night and said he felt a presence behind him on the stairs. He looked back up and uh, he looked up back up behind him and saw nothing. He kept walking downstairs and realized the sound of steps creaking was out of sync with his footsteps. He then heard an unmistakable footstep on the stair directly behind him. In a panic, he ran down the stairs and locked himself in the bathroom. He said it sounded like someone matched his pace behind him as if he barely made it um, as if he barely made it to the bathroom in time. Someone said it someone said it sounded like someone matched his pace behind him as if he barely made it to the bathroom in time. Okay. 
Uh, terrified, he finishes his business and went back upstairs. It's probably my sister trying to scare me, he thought. He went into her room, and she appeared fast asleep. Still doubting, he reached in her blankets to feel her feet. <laughs> to feel her feet. Oh yeah, that's not creepy at all. Uh, to his horror, they were warm and she didn't move a muscle, which led him to conclude that she had not followed him down the stairs. Oh boy, I'll bet, she get, I'll bet she would get even with you later on, though, she had found out what you did to her while she was sleeping. Anyway, as the years went on, my father said these occurrences became more commonplace. Even his parents acknowledged it and almost grew to have a, an affinity to whatever entities were sharing their home. Dishes would rattle, footsteps could be heard, doors opening and closing. Uh, they never shared their experiences with anyone for the fear of being thought of as crazy. In later years, when I was a kid, my grandma would host her Bible studies and sewing groups down in the basement of the home in my, in my uh, grandmother's sewing room. My dad went outside one day to find a group of elderly women leaving the home in a rush. Grandma told him that they uh, sorry, Grandma told him that they heard the ghosts walking about upstairs and thought there was a burglar. My grandma assured them it was no burglar and said, "Oh, it's just the ghosts." This prompted the women to pack up and leave. <laughs> uh, a burglar's bad enough, but now you're telling us a ghost. Okay, yeah, no, we're definitely out. You know, uh, if it was a burglar, we might have stuck around, but it's a ghost. Okay, we're leaving. Uh, the family being Protestant Baptists, I don't think anyone knew what to make of it. The belief in human spirits left on Earth did not fit within their ideology, and yet they couldn't bring themselves to believe that the entities in their home were demonic in nature. Hence, the haunting of my grandparents' home is just something the families always kept tucked away and talked about only every once in a while as a peculiar thing. One last strange happening to note, for the 50-plus years my grandparents lived in that home, a massive plum tree in their backyard bore fruit every year. Enough for my grandma to share with everyone, make ample pies, and for me to eat from while climbing the tree. Right after my grandparents passed, the tree never produced again, despite our efforts and the efforts of the new homeowners. There were also two white doves that began visiting our two homes just days after their passing. And yes, the new homeowners eventually did inquire of my dad about strange occurrences in the home, and he just laughed and said, it's just the ghosts. The new occupants moved out after less than a year in the home. Signed, Joshua. <laughs> that is great! I love that, Josh. Thank you so much for sending that. I I gotta say, the paragraph, the family being Protestant Baptists, don't know, they don't think anybody knew what to make it of it, the belief in human spirits left on earth did not fit with their ideology, that is actually something that I'm struggling with right now. That is exactly where I am. I, how do you explain all these things that happen? Because they don't, so many of these stories don't feel like they're demonic. Uh, so quite, quite often, some of them are, uh, th there's like a beneficial feeling. Somebody feels like they're loved, or they're, they're feeling like somebody's reaching from the other side just to let them know they're okay, so they find comfort in that. Um, there's no like evil feeling or dark feeling about it. And not that uh, not, not that a demon would absolutely have to have those those characteristics, but just the more we get into it, the, the more I, I begin to wonder, like what what do I believe and why do I believe it when it comes to ghosts? Because uh, I you I was in the I was in the in the camp that all ghosts uh, were demonic, and. I still want to believe that because I, I keep thinking that's where my faith is, but my faith is a bit shallow there recently because I, I just really don't know exactly uh, what to make of it with all the stories that I read. So I would pr I'll probably need to someday, if I really want answers, go to a uh, go to a Christian apologist who also has paranormal experience behind them, and I don't know who that would be. Uh, but anyway, it's just interesting that you that you typed that out because that man that hit me exactly where I am right now. Um, couldn't bring themselves to believe the entities in the home were demonic in nature. Yeah, so the hint. So yeah, I would keep. I, I wouldn't nowadays. I wouldn't nowadays. If I had a haunting, I would tell you all about it. But I I think maybe there was a time, especially early in my faith, that I probably would not have told people about it because I'd be afraid of how they would respond. So yeah, I could, I could totally see where your uh, family was coming from on that. Uh, okay, this next one comes from... just want to make sure that they uh, are okay with me using their name. 
Stephen. Hey, they're one of my patrons. Stephen, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, they're, they're part of the Darkness Syndicate. Um, they're based in the UK. They had a number of interesting experiences. Some explained, some to make one laugh. Okay, an episode I was just listening to made me think that I should share some of these. Um, a. Would have been about 2004-ish. was driving at night through the New Forest, the South UK, uh, country, very narrow roads, trees each side, no other vehicles about, noticed a white light next to me in the trees. It shocked me a bit. Faster I drove, unto 60 miles per hour, it kept up with me, and this was amongst the trees. Would guess about the size of an English football or a soccer ball to US friends. I slowed down, it slowed. I sped up, it sped up, quite unnerving. In the end, I stopped, it stopped. It then got bigger and bigger and rose up out the trees and shot off into the sky. What was that? B. Now for the laugh. Okay, well let me let's divide this up then because you've got three different stories here. Let me re let me reply to that first story. When you were when you were doing that at first, I thought, okay, it's just the moon behind the trees that's following you. I that's it's it's an optical illusion. But when you stop and it gets bigger and bigger and then rises up out of the trees and flies off into the sky, okay, all right, that's probably not the moon. <laughs> I don't know what it was. That that sounds like an orb situation, or yeah, uh, you know, like like, a, like a, a ghostly orb, a paranormal orb, or extraterrestrial. That that could be uh, that ha that happens quite often with uh, with uh, UFO cases. They'll have something that that uh, that uh, approaches that that look, that description. Okay, uh, story B. He's, you say now for a laugh. I again driving at night through Av Avebury, uh, famous for its huge stone circle, bigger than Stonehenge, and crop circles in the area, which I have seen. But one actually drives through the stone circle, and there's a sharp 90-degree bend. As I went about this bend, stood. As I went around this bend, stood in front of me were three creatures: slender, two legs, whitish body, angular head with big almond eyes, all looking straight at me. They must have been four feetish tall. Emergency stop. Heart racing. What the? The thoughts that run through one's head at that point. Then one turned. Female deer. Look directly at me, ears flat down, body and back legs hidden because of angle. I thought I was about to be abducted or something stupid. They really looked like gray aliens. <laughs> anyway, they did get out of the road, but slowly escorted me out the area. So bizarre, but funny. Oh, yeah, okay. You, you think of a deer, you think coming across them on, on a road, you kind of see them from a side angle. So you see all four legs and the body and everything else. But if they are if they're, if they're looking straight at you, if they're pointed straight at you, you would only see the two front legs, and then you'd see the you'd see the eyes, which are big eyes. If they're if they're whitish gray in color, wow, yes, I could totally see how you would think that's an alien when it's nighttime and you can't really get a really good three dimensional view of them. Uh, that that's great. I love that. Okay, and then uh, story C. This must be about 1997 ish. Camping, sat outside tent in the dark watching night sky with elder son drinking beers. Saw satellites, planes, all the normal stuff. Discussed UFOs, but son thought I was an idiot for thinking that there could be something. Anyway, um, see, the kids always, they, they always know best, don't they? Kids, kids know everything. You're obviously an idiot because you're an adult. Kids, they have all the knowledge in the universe. Just ask them. Okay, anyway, uh, this light shot across the sky and stopped. I said, what is that? Military? I flashed it with my torch, flashlight. Uh, got a flash back. Flashed it twice. Got two flashes back. Flashed it three times. Got three flashes back. It then went from the horizon to horizon in an instant. I have never been forgiven for that, for that incident. Forgiven? For what? What did you do that you'd need for... Maybe you meant forgotten. Maybe you've never forgotten that incident because you have nothing to be forgiven for. <laughs> you didn't do anything wrong there. You flashed the flashlight and they, whatever. Okay, anyway, that's, that's really cool. Uh, many more stories to tell, including accidentally meeting a large, uh, largest military surveillance drone, I think being tested, which scared me. Uh, uh, you could probably tell the stories better than me, signed Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that, especially the, the deer, the alien deer. That's great. I love <laughs> I love that one. That sounds like something that I should jump onto AI and try to try to recreate that photo. A uh, deer from uh, a deer from head on. It looks like a gray alien. Uh, okay, this is uh, 
Candy. Hey, Candy. Um, okay, these happened all in the same house. This is my family's first house, at least the first house I remember. My mom and I had an apartment first. I grew up there. It was a nice one. Some background info there. Anyway, to my stories. I'd say this one happened 10 plus years ago. I don't remember the dates, but I won't forget these stories. I was walking down the stairs like normal, as usual. Then, midway on the staircase, my leg went up ramrod straight up. I was dragged down the stairs by an unseen force, like something pulling me. Wow. Um, I was not hurt. The second one just as scary, if not scarier, than the previous one. I was uh, chased from the basement by a horned shadow figure. All the way up the stairs, through the kitchen, down the hall to my bedroom. When I turned around to slam my door shut, it was gone. I only knew what it looked like uh, without turning around because it projected its image into my head. Can shadow figures slash demons do that? I have to walk through the kitchen to get to the basement door. It's a narrow kitchen. This last story is sweeter and happened more recently this year. As you know, I lost my grandma in 2022. Well, in 2023, under a year later, in March lost my aunt and my pet gecko named Coco. Coco passed on grandma's birthday, March 23rd. My aunt was cremated in an angel urn with her mom's ashes. Uh, a month or two ago, I played the song by Chicago, the one that's got, you're the meaning in my life, you're the inspiration. I started crying. Then I heard the floor creaked outside the bedroom where the angel urn is kept. I was home alone. No one else was there at the time. I remember telling my mom this when she re-entered the house after what had happened. With all the grief, I don't remember what my mom's response was. Well, that's all my true stories. April 23rd, I asked my boy, my uh, BFF or hers or anyone else's true stories, hoping to hear them here. I'll email them in the future. If she gets back to me, she can take forever, JK, a few days to reply. Um, and this was just uh, about a week ago that she sent that, so she's probably still waiting on those stories. Uh, well, thank you, Candy. I appreciate that. Uh, can shadow figures, demons do that? Uh, insert images into your mind? I think they can. Uh, I, I think we've all probably um, experienced it. Maybe we didn't know we did. But I, I can tell you, every morning when I get ready to start doing my Bible study and sit down and try just to be quiet and pray, um, if I don't ask God to take away the distractions and to keep out any uh, inhibiting thoughts... Um, I'll, I'll have a hard time concentrating. Something will pop into my head. It, usually things that I should not be thinking about. It's stuff that'll come out of nowhere. Stuff is like, how, how am I reading this? And that thought came in. You know, it has nothing to do with the text that I'm reading or nothing with the audio that I'm listening to. It just, it just shows up. Um, now, granted, being, uh, being right-brained, we creatives, we do have lots of rabbit trails that our brains go through. I understand that. But still... Um, I, I do believe that, yeah, I think, it, I think, especially demons, I don't know about ghosts, um, but demons, I think they can definitely, you know, insert images into your mind in order to, to negatively influence you. Absolutely. Uh, okay, we got one last email. Uh, this one is not signed. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Oh, I take it back. Oh, so this is Candy again. Okay, so I guess her friend did get back to her and sent a couple stories. Oh, okay. Um, so she says, uh, this is Candy. I asked my friends for their experiences, so Jen has two. Enjoy. She gave me permission to use them for Fireside Frights. Jen sent me the below. Heard you were looking for ghost stories. I've got two. All right. Well, great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jen, if you're listening. Uh, Candy, uh, tell Jen to listen to this. I'm sure you will. Uh, in high school, I did tech theater one semester. Helped build sets for an upcoming production. I was high up on a catwalk about 50 feet above the stage. I was working with some weights on some of the pull lines, I think. I heard my friend Josh at the other end of the catwalk. I wasn't sure why he was on the other end, so naturally I started walking towards him. And about halfway across the catwalk, I felt a cold spot right where I was and could see my breath. To top it off, I felt like someone was standing right beside me with a hand on my shoulder. I ran to the ladder and got down to find my friend waiting and asking why I'd come down this way. He said he hadn't called me. That was my one and only encounter with Hamlet, our high school theater ghost. Past students and even our theater director had stories. Lights coming on with no one around was one of the common occurrences. 
Uh, yeah. All right. Before I get to your second story, Jen, uh, theaters are are so known for this kind of stuff. Um, I was in, in high school. I was in the theater as well, so I know what you're talking about. Did some tech, mostly. Mostly, I was the, I was the one on stage doing the acting, but we did have to build our own sets, and so. Uh, before production, we would all have to get together and build stuff like that. I was never on a catwalk. I was never that brave. I was never asked to go up into a catwalk. I think probably because I was too big. Uh, even before I got fat, I was still a big guy. I was like like football player size. And so maybe there just wasn't enough room for a, on a catwalk or whatever. I don't know why I, I never made it up there. Uh, I always thought it'd be cool to be up there, though. Um, but yeah, um, in fact... I'm going to have to find, when I'm done done recording this, I'm going to have to find the episode I did about theaters being haunted. Uh, or, 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 or actually um, superstitions in the theater. And a lot of them are ghost-based. Uh, if I can find it, I'll try to place a link in the episode description uh, when I post this. Um, but I might, for, I might between now and then, I might forget to do that. But I'll, I'll, tr I'll, I'll try to remember to do that. But yeah, um, theaters are notorious. For being haunted so many so many things happen in a theater there's so much emotion and energy that goes into a theater either from the the performers or the audience um lots of anger happens in a theater when when in, in rehearsals you know what i'm talking about uh so yeah there's a lot of emotion i think that probably gets burned in to the the theater atmosphere so but it's interesting that you guys not only have a ghost that you have that you've named him hamlet i think that's pretty cute uh, okay, in your second story, I was visiting in Arizona near Mesa. I don't remember where, somewhere past Superstition Mountain. I and three others found an old graveyard. Very old. Most of the stones were kids. We walked around and got the idea to ask questions and record. We had two different people recording. My friend Trevor was asking, was asking questions. Is anyone here? Does anyone have anything they want to say? What's your name? Anyway, we creeped ourselves out and left. Later that night, we listened to both recordings in sync. We thought we heard on one a small noise, not any of us, not on the other recording, so we uploaded the recording and tried to isolate or figure out the noise. With the laptop volume up high, after Trevor asked, what's your name, a small, female-sounding voice distinctively said, Sarah, plain as day. None of us slept well that night. Do not go to a graveyard and ask questions, just... Well, yeah. What? <laughs> you're you're creeped out. There's there's somebody send me a text. I'll, I'll I'll get that after we're done here. I'm almost done. Um, so you go to a you go to a graveyard. You record yourselves and you go back and listen to it, and that creeps you out. And you're saying, "Don't ever go to a graveyard and ask questions." What did you expect to happen, Jen? <laughs> that was the whole reason you went there was because you wanted something on tape. That was the whole point. Oh, that's funny. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that, though. Uh, Candy, give Jen a big hug for us. I uh, really appreciate her sending those in. Um, that's it for tonight. If you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, again, go to the website, WeirdDarkness.com. You can click on Tell Your Story, and you can, uh, and you can send it in. And if you like the show in general... Uh, please, as I always say, share it with somebody that you know who loves paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, unsolved mysteries, all the other fun stuff I do here. Um, if you do want to email me that's not a story, you could still do that. It's just Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. But I do ask if it's a story to share on Fireside Frights that you do go to the website and click on Tell Your Story. There's uh, that, that way it, 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 it separates them so I know what your email is, is for. Um, I got free audiobooks on the website. I've got the email newsletter. Like I said, I'm going to start giving away prizes on that again. Uh, there's a couple of other podcasts, including Church of the Undead and a new sci-fi podcast called Auditory Anthology, which I'm having a lot of fun with. Um, got the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts. Somebody mentioned that they got the Future Ghost t-shirt there, which is pretty cool. Uh, that has t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, other stuff. Um, and of course, that's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page. If, uh, if some of these stories maybe have triggered you, um, uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe you're feeling depressed. Uh, please know that you're not alone. You can go to the Weird Darkness. Uh, you can go to WeirdDarkness.com/hope, and there are resources there uh, that you can that you can go to, and you, there's people you can talk to absolutely free uh, who know what you're going through. They've been there before. 
they can help you through it. Um, all stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise. I'm assuming that all the stories were sent tonight were true. Um, Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'll leave you with uh, a little light. 1 John 3.18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And a final thought. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. He's not done with you. No matter your age, you are a work in progress. I'm Darren Marlar. Thank you for joining me by the fire for a Fireside Frights episode of Weird Darkness. Hey, weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.